I'd like to. Yeah, we're on now. We're on now. Great. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to call to order the regular board meeting of the uh, District 128. Um, if we could uh, please begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Great. Can I have roll call, please? Jim Batson. Here. Sarah Benjamin. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Tara Drumkey. Wasn't she here? She's oh, she was. She's up. Lisa Hessel. Here. Sonal Kokarni. Here. Casey Rooney. Here. Great. We note all members except for Tara Drumkey present, and we wish her a speedy recovery. She's homesick. Um, first, we're going to review the agenda. You'll note the first item on our agenda tonight is a public hearing on the 2022 tax levy. After that, we will have communication with an invitation for public comment. Uh, we will hear our school uh, student school board representative reports and good news where we congratulate some uh, members of our school community. Uh, then we will move on to our consent vote agenda. These are items that we have discussed extensively in committee, routine things that we normally vote on with one motion. <clears throat> After that, we'll have action items where we vote on things individually, including employment of employees, our community education program, the Vernon Hills High School community liaison position, uh, the 2022-2023 superintendent goals, our 2022 tax levy where we will uh, vote, and finally, our state maintenance grants, our NIH IP designee, and disposal of obsolete equipment. Uh, then we will have a presentation on our recent Illinois school report card, spoiler alert. Both of our schools received exemplary designations once again. Uh, then we will share some information. Uh, we will have our superintendent's report from Dr. Herman. Uh, we will have uh, board comments uh, and events, anything that uh, we've attended, we'll share with each other, uh, any events or training that we've uh, taken part in since we last met. Uh, we have an ISB report from Jim Batson. Just a quick reminder. Yeah. Uh, do we have anything from CEDAW this evening? No. Nothing from CEDAW, thank you. And any other reports that we might have? And then we will discuss future agenda items and then we will adjourn. So first on the agenda tonight, um, I'd like to declare the uh, 2022 tax levy hearing open. I invite any members of the public wishing to comment on the 2022 tax levy to the podium. Going once, going twice. Seeing none, we will move on to the presentation of the 2022 tax levy. Um, when we start off, um, would you mind sharing with the public how many times, like the timeline of when we started talking about this and Mm -hmm. how often we've discussed this before tonight yeah i believe uh i believe we have a slide in there um so whoop, there we go all right um so the just the prior steps so this is not the first time we've talked about this this is this particular levy has been in mind since uh back in february 2022 when we looked at our five-year financial projection <clears throat> um because this is a significant year for our levy um we also talked about this during our fiscal year 23 budget discussions over the summer um, we've talked about it very specifically at our last four meetings, um, including tonight. Um, we had the notice in the Daily Herald, um, and then a meeting as recent as a week ago, and again tonight. Um, so this, is, this has been our, on our agenda for many meetings um, within the past year. So um, just to give a, a brief recap, um, in general, what you find in the United States is uh, state and local uh, are the main sources of revenue for school districts. Um, local is usually always property taxes. Um, it could include student fees as well, but you see on average a share between the state and the local. In Illinois, however, there is a more reliance on property taxes as a system. That's, that's what was designed uh, by the state legislature. And so about two thirds come from the local community, um, a quarter come from the state on average. But then in District 128, 88% of our revenue comes from property taxes. 95% of our total revenue comes from our local community, including 
uh, student registration fees, interest income, things like that. Uh, so um, this, this is our single most uh, important source of revenue for the district, as it is for most school districts in Illinois. Um, one thing that is important for this year is the TIF district in Libertyville. Um, it's too hard to explain what a TIF is right now, but please reference our prior meetings. Um, but it was established in 1986. It was extended um, and expired December, 30, December 31st of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that expiration, all of those properties, um, they've been paying taxes, but now they come back on the district tax rolls. So instead of the owners that are paying the taxes now, <laughs> they go into the TIF fund, it will shift and go back to all the other taxing districts, depending on how they levy. Um, additionally for us, when that extension happened, there was an agreement that 70% of the money during the extension period that went into the TIF was surplus back to the district. So for us, for example, our check last year was a million dollars. And we're gonna get another million dollar roughly check this spring, but after that, it, it stops based on how property taxes are timed. Uh, so uh, it's important for us to recapture re recapture that revenue uh, for our operations. Um, doo -doo. All right, so this is uh, just a brief a brief um, diagram of how a how a levy or how a TIF typically works. Um, it's the values are frozen at the beginning of the TIF and they last for 23 years, and then as that property grows in value. Um, so as the downtown Libertyville grew in value since 1986, that increment um, was taxed and that money was put into the TIF fund that is controlled by the village and used for purposes of uh, uh, catalyzing redevelopment in the downtown Libertyville area. Um, however, uh, this was not a typical TIF uh, because at um, before it expired, it was extended um, for another 12 years. And so with that extension, that's the 70% surplus that I mentioned was really going back to the taxing district. So really only about 30% of the actual TIF increment was going to the TIF for the last 12 years. Uh, so in other words, we've already been getting 70% of this money anyways, but in order for us to keep getting the money, we, you have to levy for it now. Um, so here, here is an example of what I mean about in terms of where the, TIF, where the TIF money goes. So if you happen to live in downtown Libertyville in the TIF zone, if you look at your tax bill, you will see uh, the different portions that go for District 128, so I got a little clicker here, uh, sorry, Brian, um, that go for District 128, about 300 bucks for on a total tax bill of 21,000, 20,000 has been going into the TIF. And so that, that's been going on for decades. Um, what would happen then is, so this is taking a, prop, a, a house in the TIF and then a house literally across the street that is not in the TIF, their future tax bills, you know, I couldn't get the dollars to match up exactly because they're real properties. But essentially, it redistributes back so the money goes directly to the different districts. So all those numbers go up, and then the TIF doesn't exist anymore. So uh, the total the total change in the bottom the total the total uh, the total amount paid by the property owners is not really going to change relatively anything anything relative to anybody else. But the specific amount that goes directly to the district or all the other districts is definitely going to go up. Um, so. Oh, you want to help me out? There we go. Um, all right. So here is uh, just a high level view of the numbers of what we're talking about. So what we're ex we're estimating that we're going to get an increase on based on state law is 7.52%. Uh, what makes that up? 5% CPI, uh, which is essentially the rate of inflation that we're allowed to access under the law. Even though the CPI that came out there was 7%, and inflation right now is, I think, still higher than 7%, um, it's capped at 5% for existing owners. Uh, and then new property. Um, that didn't exist before um, is now now getting taxed, so that would increase uh, the levy as well as the Libertyville TIF coming out. So that 1.87 percent is a is a pretty good portion um, additional on top of the 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 existing value. Um, so we're estimating 7.5 percent increase in the taxes, but we're going to levy for 7.88. Um, now that is based on the 7.52 that we think is going to happen plus a little bit extra for cushion because these are based on an algebraic formula that are based on values that we won't really know until the spring. And so we have to guess. We try to have accurate guesses, but the guesses could be wrong. Um, the information we could get could be wrong for a variety of reasons. So we put a little bit of cushion in there. We feel that that is uh, plenty, of, plenty of room for us within any, any kind of reason. Um, for context, 
uh, the existing values in the district, the taxable values are increasing about 3%. So that means on average, the assessed values, which also essentially would mean the fair market value, are increasing on average in the district about 3%. So what does that mean if you're existing taxpayer in the district? That means if your actual individual assessment on your house increases by 3%, then your taxes would go up by 5%. Your assessed value goes up by more than 3%. Your taxes could go up more than 5%. If your assessed value goes up by less than 3%, then your taxes may go up less than 5%. So, And is it correct to say the district, District 120 has nothing to do with individual homeowners' assessed values? That strictly comes from the county. Uh, that That's through the township. The township assessors, the county assessors, uh, and then depending on the different board of review, the county level board of review or the state level board of review, uh, but we don't determine taxable values. That's correct. Um, uh, one other thing is Public Act 102-895 that was passed uh, requires um, every school district to disclose uh, their cash balances during their levy hearings. Well, um, it doesn't say much more than that. So some districts are not totally sure uh, exactly what balances we're supposed to show or how reason. So I'm going to show you the two most important ones that I can think of. One is our cash balances as of the end of our last fiscal year. So June 30th, 2022, there are the cash balances. So total of 80.2 million. Um, and that's that would be the cash balances at the end of June. Um, then... Um, the more recent cash balances um, as of October 31st, so the end of end of our month, October that we just finished, uh, cash balances of 97,982,000 that you can see there. And so um, those, are, those are our two most recent numbers in terms of cash balances that we think are complying with this law uh, that we disclosed this. Uh, one interesting note is October is, is oddly enough, the highest cash point we have based on the timing of taxes. So those of you that are taxpayers, you would have paid your second installment perhaps at this point. And so the districts now all have those revenues. So we have the highest, we're at the highest cash point we have and then we will start trickling down because we start spending those revenues um, up until we get another tax infusion in the spring. So- and Real quick, I'd like yeah. to point out, I know there's a lot of numbers on that page. Um, one important one that isn't there is the debt service fund because our district does not have debt. Our taxpayers are not paying to service debt for this district. That's correct. We are a debt-free district and have been so uh, for a number of years. Um, so yes. Um, all right. So the next steps is we're the levy hearing right now. Uh, and then we have it on agenda for adoption for tonight. So that's the levy information. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to, at 7.15, declare the levy hearing closed. Uh, we will move on to communication, and I will invite uh, first, uh, based on the sign-in sheet in the order received, um, and I will ask everybody limit themselves to three minutes. Um, I also will invite you, if somebody else has spoken and said exactly the same thing, you don't have to say the same thing again. You may, if you wish but you may add your name to their comments in order to uh, move things along, but that's your choice. Um, so first on the list, I'd like to invite uh, Tom Merrill to the podium. Well, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you this evening. My name is Tom Merrill, and I'm a musician in the North Suburban Wind Ensemble that is part of the Community Education Program here in District 128. I've been a member of the ensemble almost since its inception, uh, having joined the ensemble in the second year of existence. First and foremost, we wish to express our sincere gratitude to District 128 for the support they have provided to the band since it began a decade ago. The access to resources, particularly rehearsal rooms and concert venues, has been key to providing the opportunity for this ensemble to grow and thrive. The support from the district has allowed us the ability to have a place to gather and rehearse and a stage upon which to offer performances to the community multiple times in the year, all at a minimal cost that makes participation and concert attendance accessible. And we're happy to report uh, that uh, just despite the setbacks of the recent pandemic that has waged uh, all performing ensembles such as ours, uh, as evidenced at our concert one week ago, the band is musically strong and growing again. We wouldn't exist without the support and for that we are tremendously grateful. In my previous career, 
I spent 10 years as a high school band director. When I first graduated from college, I promised myself to find an ensemble so that I could continue playing because I knew that keeping myself on the other side of the podium, remembering what that's like and remembering what it is about music that ignited a spark within me would ultimately help me to be a more effective and passionate music educator. The North Suburban Wind Ensemble consists of a number of music educators in the area, and I'm certain that their involvement in the ensemble is helping them create incredible music programs for not only District 128, but a number of other districts as well. Some participants drive nearly an hour to attend rehearsal. So this ensemble is having a wide positive effect in our region, and that also speaks to the quality of the ensemble. One of the things all music educators work to instill in their students is the idea of lifelong musicianship, that we shouldn't pack the instrument away in an attic after we graduate from high school that you don't need to follow a career path in music to continue playing, being creative and expressing yourself artistically. The North Suburban Wind Ensemble is a perfect model example of what that goal should resemble. It brings together not only music educators, but musicians from multiple careers and walks of life with a shared interest, and it creates something extraordinary. Beyond all this, it is at its heart an enjoyable and meaningful way to build community, not only among the membership, but extending to our audiences who attend our concerts. It is a source of community engagement that reflects positively on District 128, positioning it as a leader who understands the value and impact of arts education. In fact, currently and over the years, not only have a number of District 128 music educators been a member of the ensemble, but also a number of district alumni as well, continuing the journey they began in their schools right here. Far more than a hobby, this is a way for us as adults to remember and keep alive what it was that first sparked our love of music as students and to give back to the community and the culture that nurtured us. The elimination of the community education program here in District 128 will jeopardize the existence of the North Suburban Wind Ensemble and the positive experiences and qualities that it adds to the community in general. Mr. Merrill, at you're a, at three minutes, so I'm done. just respectfully asking you to wrap it up. At a time when we see a lot of inhumanity in the world, it would be tragic to see one of the things that truly makes us human disappear. Thank you for your time and reconsideration of this important decision. Thank you, Mr. Merrill, and thank you for being so respectful of the time. Um, next, I'll invite uh, Don Short to the podium. Good evening. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak with you tonight in regards to the District 128 Community Education Program. I do have a few concerns, and among those are the fact that uh, those who administrate the program had very, very little notice as to the action that being voted on this evening. Um, I can tell you as an instructor that I never had any notice that this was even being considered. And I'm, I'm also concerned that community members who participate in this program, who may be participating in the future uh, or have participated in the program, also had no notice. Uh, this is a big concern to me. It seems to me that there's a great deal of haste in this decision. One more question or one more thought. I uh, wonder if anyone from the administration ever asked for input or suggestions as to possible solutions that might save the 74-year-old program. For example, raising the fees or placing reasonable quotas on class size before classes are offered. If I could, I would suggest that the committee that a committee be formed uh, uh, with those involved, uh, administration and members involved in the community ed program to, to find solutions to perhaps preserve this program. Uh, the District 128 mission statement mentioned the importance of lifelong learning. If that is indeed a priority of District 128, I hope a compromise can be reached during an amicable discussion to ameliorate the situation. I hope the board will consider the possibility of perhaps tabling the vote until uh, further, dis uh, further discussion and research is done on this program. Thank you very much. Um, next, I'd like to invite, there's a, I, I'm not able to read the first name because it's not legible, but um, someone with the last name Joshi, please. Can you tell me your first name? I'm so sorry, I can't read it. Hi, my first name is Radhika. Hi, Radhika. I'm sorry that I couldn't read your name. That's fine. Thank you. Um, 
My name is Radhika Joshi, and I'm here on behalf of the ISA. I'm the advisor for ISA uh, at Vernon Hills um, with the support, encouragement, and advice uh, from Mrs. Young, Mr. Vaughn, and um, Dr. Gilliam. We are here uh, with our petition um, to recognize Diwali as a, a holiday, school holiday. And I have a few members speaking on our behalf. And uh, they will be, I promise you, they will be brief. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hello, good evening. My name is Rupa Amara, and I am a Sunday school teacher at Janma Mission Yamanotri, which is a school of Vedantic study. Today, I am here to talk to you about what Diwali is and how it is being celebrated. Every year, millions of Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs, Jains across all over the world celebrate Diwali, India's biggest and most important religious holiday of the year. The word Diwali, also known as Dipavali at some times, means row of lights in Sanskrit. This religious festival is an auspicious occasion that celebrates light over darkness, good over evil, and knowledge over ignorance. On this day, Sri Mahalakshmi, the goddess of wealth, abundance, and well-being is worshiped. People spend days cleaning and decorating their homes, making beautiful rangolis with colored sand and flowers, um, lighting up diyas, which are like clay uh, lamps filled with oil. And then they decorate their whole homes and all do welcome and worship goddess Lakshmi to invite them to their home, into their heart. Additionally, Hindus perform rituals called puja to pray to goddess Lakshmi. Diwali festivities take place in large communities. People get ready early in the morning with their brand new clothes that they buy for the festival, go to the temple with mountains and mountains of food that they have prepared earlier and offer it to the Lord. And uh, after that food is offered to the Lord, it is becomes the prasad, which is the offering that we get back, which is given to the people as well as the poor and the needy. And then uh, after all that festivities are done at the uh, temple, there are some more festivities that happen. The pujas happen at home also. So in addition to all these things that we do, we also in the evenings go out to friends, families, relatives, neighbors, bring the prepared sweets that we have uh, prepared, offer it to them and the foods that we do. And finally, at night, there is the sky full of glitter and full of rumble of, due to all of the fireworks that we perform at that night. And this is just a special occasion. Diwali also marks as the beginning of Hindu New Year. Unfortunately, our cultural roots that were once deep in getting, that, that were once deep are getting hollow as our children are in school, unable to participate in this auspicious day. May our next generation of youth get the exposure of our Diwali traditions and customs so that they can learn and move forward with those traditions to their own kids moving forward. Thank you. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Anari Amara and I'm a sophomore at Vernon Hills High School. I serve as the current Vernon Hills High School Indian Student Association's president. I'm here to further discuss making the volley an official school holiday. So getting onto the statistical side of this, over 10% of the D128 students are South Asian and most of which are Hindu. Adding to this already prevalent number of students, the Jains, Buddhists, and Sikhs of our districts also celebrate this holiday. Like our previous speaker said, a typical day of Diwali would include cleaning the house, decorating it, going to the temple for a large chunk of the day, and spending time with family and friends. However, for a typical Hindu student, this day consists of going to school for eight hours, coming home in the evening, and then studying immediately for midterms, since Diwali falls during midterm season. Many students also have clubs or sports, which further inhibits them from participating in Diwali and getting immersed in their cultures most celebrated holiday. However, as many of us Hindu students want to participate in celebrations, we try to spend as much time as possible celebrating Diwali after school, which just leads to more stress about tests and homework due to the next day at school and sleep deprivation. 
altogether making the volley an unenjoyable experience when it should be the complete opposite, a joyous day. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sai Goginani and I'm a senior here at Vernon Hills High School. I am currently VHHS um, ISA di uh, Director of Media and I will be speaking about um, US recognition of Hinduism. As of right now, 20 states in the US have declared the month of October as Hindu Heritage Month for the contributions that this religion has made to America through its unique and great heritage. Importance of this initiative would go towards dispelling misinformation and provide a resource to educate, inform, and inspire not only non-Hindus, but also encourage especially the younger Hindu generation. Recently on the news, we have been seeing that schools in the US are becoming more inclusive towards Hindu traditions, specifically Diwali. For example, New York has just made Diwali a public school holiday, and schools in California, New Jersey, and Washington are doing the same as well. Around the country, schools are increasingly recognizing Hindus as a group. Additionally, if we follow through with this initiative, we would be the first district to recognize Diwali as a holiday in Illinois, and we can be a model for schools in not only in Illinois, but also schools in neighboring states. Thank you. My name is Iman Dayala, and I'm a practicing Muslim here in grade 10 at Vernon Hills High School. Last year, the College Board hosted the first set of AP exams on May 2nd. While this was alarming for many students, it was disheartening for Muslims as it meant having to skip out on an important religious holiday, Eid al-Fitr, a three-day-long celebration after a month of fasting. As saddening as the lack of empathy we received from the College Board was, I took comfort in knowing that Vernon Hills High School cared for its Muslim students. Last year was the first time I remember not having to attend school on Eid al-Fitr. Here at District 128, our cultures and differences are celebrated. Vernon Hills High School saw an opportunity to advocate for its Muslim students and took it, something I know my friends and I were extremely grateful for as it broke down barriers we all had to grow up with. That said, these barriers still exist for my Diwali celebrating peers. Students are here today asking for a day off in order to be divulged in their own culture. Ten years from now, these students will not remember the specifics of what they learned in English class on Diwali, but if given the day off, they will be able to make memories that, will, that they will carry with them for a lifetime. By allowing our students to be immersed in their culture, we lead to a new generation with an array of minds ready to bring new insight into an array of projects and whatever the world throws at them. Thank you. She didn't look at notes, I know. We're, we're noticing uh, that you did not use any notes. That was very impressive. Nicely done. Um, <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am Ara Vamrolia, and I'm a sophomore at LHS. Diwali is a time of celebrating brotherhood and the joy of others around you, which allows children to learn important lessons such as respect, discipline, divinity, and kindness, and other aspects of life that can be passed on to future generations. A helpful analogy might be the way Christians celebrate Christmas or Easter and are also celebrated by other multiple faiths, just like how Diwali can be celebrated not just by Hindus, but all other faiths to teach lessons and overall a better way of life. From a personal side, a day off or extension of assignments or tests would genuinely help me enjoy the holiday and tradition meaningfully without the demanding pressure of schoolwork, test prep, and extracurricular <coughs> or after-school activities. For example, I'm a multi-sport athlete with many honors and AP classes. This limits me from fully being able to cherish the tradition and culture of my holiday, and I'm not the only one. For example, ISA Club posted a petition on October, on October 23rd, less than a month ago, and already received 622 signatures in support of getting Diwali off as a school holiday. These supporters are people of our own community who believe celebrating every culture will lead to a brighter future. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ishani Anand. I'm a sophomore at Vernon Hills High School, and I'm a part of the ISA Exec Board as the Director of Communications. We decided to bring this up today because we realized that there isn't enough representation for Hindus in the school, uh, in D128. And regarding our religious holidays, sorry. Um, the, so not being able to participate in, Diwali festiv in our Diwali festivities due to school and other after-school activities it seems to be disappearing. The volley seems to be disappearing from our from our generation. Many other religions in our school are able to take a day off to follow their own traditions, such as Christmas and 
um, or such as going to church for Christmas or to the mosque for Muslim holidays and etc. And obviously some some of them, such as Christmas, Hanukkah, um, and more, are able to celebrate their holidays during the semester break. However, we Hindus are unable to do that. We believe that going forward, we should be treated equally. This inclusiveness of a Diwali holiday is extremely significant for the growing number of South Asian students in D128. The Hindu community is by nature unassuming, but the time has come for us to come out and out, come out of our shells and talk about our rich culture. We want to voice our opinions and show that we are proud of our culture and our religion. And this will be an opportunity for us as a school to put global from our mission statement in action and be a leader in Illinois. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm noting that that's everybody that has signed up for public comment. Do we have anybody else wishing to address the board? If you could. If you could state your name, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Lindsay Gill. I'm a former LHS student and uh, recently just bought my first home in Vernon Hills. Um, I chose to live in Vernon Hills because of the wonderful, dis wonderful school district, um, not only, only academically, but the um, diversity and seeing these uh, incredibly well-spoken, intelligent, brave children, sorry, young adults speak, uh, has absolutely affirmed my decision to live in Vernon Hills. Um, like as a Christian in America, my religion is uh, like catered to. Um, and I just think it's like, it's, it would be fair for um, Diwali, sorry. I'm not good at public speaking. Um, it would be very fair to have Diwali off. It's just one day, um, but it means so much to such a good portion of our district. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, and welcome to the community. Welcome, well, I should say welcome back to the community. <laughs> Anybody else wishing to address the board for public comment? <clears throat> Hello, my name is Angela Roser and I am a Libertyville resident. Uh, I've lived in Libertyville most of my life and um, I just would like to say too that I'm incredibly heartened by our young people speaking up. Continue to fight the good fight and advocate for yourselves and we just know that we support you. Me, we support you all the way. Um, I would like to circle back to the continuing education program. Part of the reason that drew me back to continue to live in Libertyville while many of my friends uh, you know, scattered to the winds in the United States is the tight-knit community. Libertyville is a town of like around 20,000, as I see when I drive past uh, Buckley. But what makes this town so important is that tight-knit community and the communities that we're able to build in the continuing education program mean a lot to me. And I just would like this to be thoroughly considered. And I would like there to be a due process and more transparency involved. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak for public comment? Seeing none, do we have any email public comment? We do. Okay. Um, I'm also going to limit those to three minutes. Okay. Excuse me. The first letter is from Jenny Itel. Good evening. I am sad to hear about the board wanting to close the community education program that has been part of Vernon Hills and Libertyville for over 70 years. I know the board has always been able to come up with great ideas and plans. I was hoping to see your work in action again to find a way to still keep the program and not yet spend all the money. I understand adding more to the price of a class is not an option. I do feel this has not been looked into further and should. Also, for example, of the 1,200 people that participate, that is a significant number. And I am sure with COVID rules changing, it would continue to grow. I am sure the board can come up with another way to reduce the staffing expense. Our buildings are equipped for these classes, and it gives the public access to our amazing schools. People want to move to our towns and live in our community because of all we offer, including community education. I feel instead of closing this or passing this to others in the community, we should be looking further into what best serves our community with these classes and continue to help the families whose children attend the schools here and continue to bring the people to our excellent towns. 
The next message is from Tony Rodkey. As an instructor of this community program, I ask the board to consider how long the program has been in effect. Give the program additional time before making the decision tonight. The community education program is a, is a great value to the district, residents, and instructors that assist in the mission of the district outside of school hours. The program ties directly to one of our strategic goals of offering alternate pathways for LHS and VHHS students, and hopefully could be integrated to achieve this goal. There is only positive comment from the constituents who have participated in the program and affordability appears to be no issue. This program also offers a great connection to several partnerships in the district. Thank you for reconsideration of discontinuing the community education program. And the next one is from Noah Weiss, who is a Vernon Hills High School student. I am writing this email to address the recent cell hotel or phone, phone slot trend in the classroom. I'm sure that many of my fellow students will agree that this is extremely annoying. I think that a student needs to have their phone with them in case that a family emergency happens or there is a time sensitive issue in the family that the family is in no way required to tell the schools. Please think about this annoying trend in the classroom and review how necessary it truly is. Thank you so much. This is from Mary M. Michael. I am writing to voice my opinion concerning the possible elimination of community-based programs offered by Community High School District 128. I am a local resident who has been enrolling in classes for over 15 years. Specifically, I participate in woodworking, make the furniture you always wanted class, which is offered each spring and fall. This class has allowed me to meet friends, learn new skills, and enrich my life. Woodworking is a male-dominated activity. This class has not only allowed me to bridge that divide, but thrive. My home is filled with pieces that were created during these classes. It also allows me to create pieces that be become handmade gifts for children and grandchildren. I have completed 30 classes, and I cannot remember a time when this class was not full. The community education mission states that the program provides a broad range of learning opportunities that reflect the needs and interests of our community members, regardless of age. This class certainly fulfills this mission. Mission. I urge you to continue this program and others that have sufficient participation. This is from Rebecca Gapples. I'm writing to respectfully request that you keep the community education program. The program has a great variety of classes and my friends and I have benefited from self-defense and cooking classes to being a member of the North Suburban Wind Ensemble. The district has fantastic facilities due in part to taxpayer funds, and it would be a shame if the whole community could not benefit from them. This is from Karen Hull. Our family has been attending the North Suburban Wind Ensemble concerts that are a part of this program for many years. I would like to say, that this band provides tremendous music for every concert and the audience experience is fantastic. Although we have enjoyed the concerts, the per performance also have an impact on the young people who have attended with their parents. Our girls have been in band since junior high and went on to major in music in college. These concerts help to inspire them to follow their dreams. It seems that when budget cuts need to be made, music and arts programs tend to be among the first cut. I would like to ask that you please reconsider continuing the funding of the community adult education program, as this is a wonderful way to share a quality music program along with other helpful programs with the community. Thank you very much. This is from Cheryl Steffens. Good evening. Tonight's meeting agenda includes the topic of the discontinuation of the D-128 Community Education Program. As a retired administrator and educator in our district, not to mention a community member here since 1982, it saddens me that this opportunity for education, educational options for the community, as well as for all district staff members who are also invited to participate, is under discussion for termination. 
The, this district's history has always been one of devotion to learning for the entire community and providing educational opportunities for all, dating back some 60 to 70 years or more before I first entered the district. When I first started here as a teacher in 1982, Adult Ed was already a long-running and highly respected program. More recently, thanks to our former Director of Community Education, Dr. Buzz Perry, and to our current director, Ms. Diane Phillips, this program now is exemplary in the variety and number of educational learning opportunities it offers for the community. <laughs> because of their efforts, this district has formed many relationships with other businesses and organizations in our community, also focused on contributing to learning opportunities for our community members. This program's offerings are affordable and convenient. Over the years, along with many others, I have appreciated several opportunities to participate in this program by taking classes such as language, playing guitar, jewelry making, gluten-free cooking, computer topics, Zumba, yoga, kickboxing, and other health and wellness topics. Yes, people are busy and can find other means of learning thanks to technology has to offer. However, we have experienced with the years of COVID pandemic and surviving months of remote learning that for many, the benefits of in-person instruction far exceed the convenience of other forms of learning. Our community education program has an important place in the learning of our district's community. Not being a part of the district now for six years, I am not aware of the circumstances for this program's termination discussion or for the change in the district's vision about providing learning to all in the community. But I do want this board to know that the program has played a significant educational role throughout the history of D128 and that it would create a disadvantage to this community to erase all of the opportunities for learning that it provides. This is from Joanna Skoog. Why is dissolving adult education on the agenda for Monday, November 14th? I simply do not understand why you would discontinue adult education next summer when this is a way to involve the community with the school district and serve a diverse group of citizens. This should have been raised as an issue when we were electing new members to the school board in the last election. I, I do not support dissolution of adult education in District 128. And this is from Angela Roserskoog. My name is Angela Roser, and I urge the board to continue the D128 Continuing Education Program. I am a proud LHS alum who first started taking continuing ed programs my senior year of high school in 2013. I was grateful and honored to play in the North Suburban Wind Ensemble, a band made up of band teachers, professional musicians, and avid music lovers. But most importantly, this band is made up of community members and friends. This is a passionate group of people brought together by their love of instrumental music, instruments, and each other. I enthusiastically participate ever since moving back home to Libertyville and have only paused due to COVID and to pursue my two graduate degrees, and I will resume upon graduating this spring. The continuing education program is a public good enriching our town, our lives in our town, and it continues to promote excellence in education in Libertyville. We chose to live in the community for its love and commitment to public education and for the tight-knit small town community connection. And we implore you to continue this legacy in the program that entails both. This is from Barbara Wilcox. This is in regards to discontinuing the community education program. I've taken several classes and have many on my list. These have included hobbies as well as potential career skills. I even had my mom take a class with me. While there are many wonderful tutorial videos on YouTube, etc., it just does not compare to in-person instruction. I think discontinuing this program would be a definite loss for the community, and I would like to see it continue. This is from Holly Hirsch. I want to state for the record that I support the adult education program. I reside in the district and believe the program benefits the community. I understand currently that many classes are full and have a wait list. It would be, help, it would be helpful 
to promote the class offerings to the community on social media as well. I learned on Facebook Sunday night that the board is going to vote on this matter this week. I am interested to learn what the community community's opinion on the matter. I hope my comments will be read at the upcoming board meeting. Um, this message is from Sean Cosme. I am a 10 year resident of District 128 and a member of the North Suburban Wind Ensemble, a course offered through D128 Community Education. I recently learned of Agenda Item 5B Community Education Program, where the recommended action is to discontinue the adult education program in June 2023. The community education program is important to me because it provides an outlet for me to pursue one of my passions. I am a high school music educator, and it is important that I practice in music making outside of school, not just for myself, but to be visible to my students and community showing that what we do in schools is long lasting well beyond high school. I am a better teacher because of my participation in this course. The North Suburban Wind Ensemble draws members from all over the Chicagoland area. While not all are D128 residents, the district should consider themselves leaders in being able to offer this kind of programming. I have recently shared the community education program with my own district that I work for who aspires to offer more to their community. You will likely hear from more of us, and I hope that the board considers the implications the termination of the community education program would have on our group. I know District 128 would never consider limiting opportunities in the arts for its students. And while there are very many good reasons as to why the entire adult education program should be discontinued, I fear, I fear that our band that has met on Tuesday evenings for the past 10 years has been overlooked when coming to this decision. District 128 strategic plan mailing sites, growth goals including health and well-being, equity and inclusion, and explore multiple paths. The existence of the North Suburban Wind Ensemble and the community education program strengthens these pillars. What better way for the community to be actively engaged in our district's mission and for our students to see it in action beyond high school. I am asking the board to reconsider this proposed action and at the very least to please provide more information to the community regarding the rationale for the decision and postpone a vote until the November, I'm sorry, until the December meeting. I am disappointed to only learn about this discussion of this action item taking place on November 7th, 2022, Program and Personnel Committee meeting. There are no notes, video, or approved minutes available from this meeting yet for me to, for me as a community member taxpayer and someone who would be directly impacted by this decision to process the discussion leading up to the decision. What I can indeed see in public board documents is an addition of a new administrative position at the district office making its staff 60% larger. Than Can you finish that sentence, please, and move on to the next one, Mary? In fiscal year 2022. Thank you. This message is from Angela and Dolphy. I am not in favor of discontinuing your community adult education program. I feel that one of the purposes of education is creating lifelong learners. I do not think that support from educators should end when the student graduates from school. Some individuals may not receive certain opportunities to cater their appreciation of learning during their childhood development. Having experiences for growth outside of our standard schooling is crucial for those that seek it. This adult education program helps those individuals further their education and provide those opportunities. For me, it gave me a sense of community and opportunity to meet new colleagues. Finding an activity where we can meet others with common interests while also furthering our love for learning can be rare. I found that the North Suburban Wind Ensemble, involving myself with that group, helped me build new connections while continuing my love for music and performing. Being part of this adult education program was beneficial for me. This program provides many opportunities for those who want to continue to learn and develop themselves. Thank you. 
This is from Maureen Monahan. Understand a discussion on this program is on tomorrow night's agenda. I would ask that this program be continued as I use it as a resource and have taken classes personally and have registered family members for the program. This is a community resource that taps into local subject matter experts, brings people to the community to gather and allows community members to learn new skills, be exposed to new ideas and come together. Not knowing the numbers on the program, cost, attendance, utilization, I would not be surprised if changes may be needed to the program. Yet, I would ask you to very much consider continuing the curriculum and the community education program. This is from Scott Adams. I am a former District 128 board member serving the district from 1997 to 2005. I am also a lifelong resident of Libertyville, LHS graduate, class of 66, president of the GLMV Chamber of Commerce, and a Libertyville Village board trustee. I heard the other day that District 128 is considering canceling the District 128 Com Community Education Program because it's running in the red. This program is the second oldest community education program in the state of Illinois. Thousands of people in the combined village communities had taken advantage of these programs for fun, expand their knowledge, or to do or to better their lives. This is a huge mistake. You, are, you currently offer 224 live classes and over 1,200 online classes that benefit the residents of District 128 and beyond. If you cancel this program, there is not another community education program that offers the breadth of classes in the area. When the pandemic hit, from a chamber standpoint, we could have easily suspended all of our meetings, events, and networking groups but chose to keep all of our programs going at a substantial cost, but we, owed, but we owed the continuation of these assets for our 600 members because it was the right thing to do. What you're considering is wrong. It warrants better discussion and the public should be involved. In reality, you are going to make a decision in a vacuum with no public comment, no notice to the public, just to save a few dollars. District 128, its two high schools, its academic status, all belong to the community and they warrant community input. The community has been more than supportive of all the activities at Libertyville and Vernon Hills High Schools. To cut the community education program sends a bad message to the, com to the District 128 community that you don't value their participation, help, or voices. So it's from Sheila Lynch. A frill, please do not consider, do, I'm sorry, please do not discontinue the D128 community education program. My family and I have taken and enjoyed classes there and would hate to have this option taken away. This is from Maddie Cardenas. This email is being sent in regards to the possibility of the closure of the adult education program. My name is Maddie Cardenas. I worked with the North Suburban Wind Ensemble from January 2018 to May 2022. This program provided me with a lot of great quality music performance for performers and audiences of all different types. This program is a great outlet for professional educators to continue a passion that does not normally exist out of, outside of the collegiate level. This group offers some of the highest quality of music performances in the Chicagoland area and stands to be one of the top ensembles in the area. The adult education program as a whole though, also allows others in the community to be a part of continued learning outside of the secondary and collegiate level. Discontinuing the program would be a big determent and a huge mistake on the District 128's end because you will lose out on so many connections by the surrounding community and you will most likely not be able to reestablish the program in the same way and keep the size of the program itself. Thank you for acknowledging these comments and I hope that the decision is made to keep the program intact. It's from Cheryl Munkin. As a member of the community and a former educator in the district, we have heard the phrase lifelong learners more than we could count. This was something that we wanted our students to understand and our district wanted us to understand. 
Our D-128 adult ed program allows us and our community as a whole to do just that. The courses are not just the typical community college courses, but a, a varied and suited for a wide range of interests within our own district community. These courses are reasonably priced and offered at convenient times for many. They are not as lengthy as most courses would be at the community college and therefore require less commitment and time for busy schedules. It is my hope that we will continue to offer this program that, was, that has evolved and changed with the times to our community and those around for many years to come. This is from Sue Gallivan. As a retiree of District 128 and an, and an instructor in the community education program, I find it very disheartening to hear that the Board of Education is considering dissolving the community education program. This is a program that has served not only the D128 community, but also the surrounding area for more than 70 years. This program has brought people together, has taught people things they only imagined they would learn to do, this is an affordable program for the seniors in our area. It's not only an education program, but a social program for so many. I know firsthand as an educator, the pleasure of seeing a student feeling self, self, excuse me, self worth from completing a project they only hoped they could complete. I also know firsthand as a student, the joy and satisfaction of learning something new and enjoyable. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the board, I am sure to the board it's financial, but to the people who reach, who, who teach and take these classes, it is much more. Please, please reconsider taking away this program that means so much to so many. This is from Madeline Diedrich. I am saddened to know that the D128 community education program is in jeopardy. My 29 years working for the district were in that department. And I have witnessed firsthand what it means to the adult population it serves. Without the benefit of current numbers in front of me, I can still assure you that the adult students come from many of the surrounding communities as far away as Chicago for your program. But the majority of them are your taxpayers. Literally thousands and thousands of people have gone through the program over its course of 75 years of history. And many of them register for classes semester after semester. I live in Mundelein, but have been taking classes in D-128 for many years, not only because I worked there, but because D-120's Board of Education disbanded the community aspect of their program years ago. Their program focuses solely on ESL and literacy. There is nothing for me. It's always been great to know that D-128 is so close by and offers such a wonderful, diverse selection of classes. I have learned so much and had such fun in every class I ever took. I'm certainly, I'm certain that others feel the same way and we, or we wouldn't keep coming back. The community ed program allows our, your taxpayers into the buildings for fun and informative classes that are very affordable. By supporting community education, the board is really giving back to the adults in the community who pay some pretty hefty taxes and may not even have children in the schools. Community education is one of the nice amenities available to residents in D-128. I know that you will very carefully consider what disbanding this program would mean to our community that you serve. Thank you for listening to someone who will miss it a lot. Two more. Um, this one is from Donna Levi. It has come to my attention that the board is considering disbanding the community, of edu community education program. I find this news very disappointing and ask you to reconsider. The Community Education Department has provided quality programs to the public for over 70 years, giving the public an opportunity to expand their knowledge and skills in a wide range of topics. Adults taking classes allows them to experience the school from their, from their child's viewpoint and see where their taxes are going. They can see the wonderful opportunities that are available to their children and if work needs to be done in the areas of the building. As a student in the program, I took my first computer class. I continued to take classes that allowed me to obtain a position with a local company doing secretarial work, art classes, dance classes, exercise programs, financial advice, and many more classes followed. I enjoyed them all and learned a great deal. 
in January of 2000, I started working as a secretary in the community education department. This allowed me to see how valuable a tool our programs were for others. I witnessed the excitement students expressed when they visited or, or called to sign up for a class and came back for more. Many worked in the area and needed to take the class to expand their skills for job promotion. Others took art classes for, for relaxation, exercise classes for fitness, financial classes to prepare for their future, dance classes for an upcoming wedding, and fun classes for children to spark their imagination. The list goes on. It is a very special program that should be allowed to continue. And the final message is from Nancy Shipley. It is my hope that in, dis that in discussing community adult education, a resolution can be made to continue the program. Dr. Buzz Perry and Diane Phillips have built this program into a very beneficial asset to our community and to the District 128 staff. I have had the pleasure of attending several classes and have enjoyed each one. Okay, thank you. Um, at long last, I'd like to turn it over to our student school board reps for their reports. Good evening. We're really excited to be here tonight to discuss some relevant and important issues many students have brought up this year. Those students were happy with many renovations that occurred throughout the summer for the field house and the cafeteria. The bathrooms at LHS specifically sparked passionate conversations. The first thing every senior I interviewed said was, the bathrooms are gross. And to be honest, they're not wrong. In addition, Dr. K asked the principal's advisory board, which project is the number one priority to improve LHS? And it was an overwhelming response of the bathrooms, followed by the cafeteria and the locker rooms. Senior Kirsten Novak expressed, the toilets are unsanitary, unsanitary run down, and often have maintenance problems. She mentioned the many times she would need to kick the door on the stall every time it got stuck which I personally also experienced. Additionally, many complain that the toilet seats are sometimes broken and the automatic toilets keep flushing unnecessarily multiple times before leaving the stall, creating water waste. Someone said that the sinks lag and drains are sometimes missing. Others were frustrated over empty soap dispensers and tissue dispensers with tissues constantly getting stuck in them. Many of the bathrooms don't afford students a great amount of privacy, and most of them were built in the 1950s or 60s and haven't been renovated since. The significance of the bathroom situation at LHS is clearly seen when comparing the bathrooms by the main entrance and the others around school. Students, students express that the ones at the front are clean and sanitary, causing them to have to walk across school just for those toilets to avoid using the unsanitary ones. This takes extra time out of class periods, which both students and teachers dislike. Faculty were also surprised when they recognized how disgusting student bathrooms were, expressing that students deserve better bathrooms. As this is the most common topic of conversation around LHS, students hope that renovations will be made to our school bathrooms to improve sanitation and keep students safe and healthy, which is really important since COVID happened. On a brighter note, many students have taken advantage of mental health days, when a student is going through a tough time and in need to take a day to focus on their mental health and well-being, their parents can call the school and instead of an excused absence, they get marked for a mental health day. With this new rule, students are allowed five days before the school begins asking for a doctor's note. Through this, students' mental health has been improving and this sheds light on the stigma surrounding mental health. This is crucial since the, based on the Illinois Youth Survey from last year, across all grades, depression symptoms have risen and serious con considerations of suicide. So this is a really relevant issue and having those mental health days really improved that. Students have been rem reminiscing over the Wednesday late start or flex period. Many mentioned that it allowed them to speak with teachers and easily make appointments to discuss retakes or topics they were confused on. The majority would love to bring them back. And honestly, I love them too. Can I just interject? Um that's an issue of having enough instructional minutes. That's why it was discontinued. Yeah. So just wanted to be sure that was clear. Yeah. In light of the LHS serve season, the season in which student council organizes the annual canned food drive to continue our tradition of giving back to our community. 
Clubs and sports have participated this year more than ever. And as a member of Student Council Executive Board, I was able to work behind the scenes this year and organize our annual neighborhood blitz. This allowed students to collect cans from their neighbors to donate to the food pantry. And over 6,000 cans were co donated this Saturday, which is a record breaker from last year. And nice job. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, some upcoming events in to like come improve donations and like increase them include the volleyball serve tournament in which volleyball players have organized teams to play a tournament to serve and support the food pantry. Their plan is to have students bring $5 or five cans to attend, and everyone can't wait to cheer on their favorite team while supporting food insecurity in our community. Additionally, the Senior Class Student Council have continued the tradition of the Senior Dodgeball Tournament, in which teams compete against each other and also fundraise for the food pantry, which is going to be happening also in December. RAD, which stands for Rape, Aggression, Defense, is a new self-defense training program at LHS, which has been running since last year. This training takes course during the freshman PE classes and is currently taught by Mr. Farrell and Ms. Watson. The key of this program is teaching students not just the physical response, but having a mindset of being safe and avoiding situations in which they could become victims. This training is a significant step to raising awareness about assault as students learn skills and gain confidence to defend themselves in violent situations. The core of the program is to teach them to de-escalate violence before using it and allow students to learn to respect others around them. Mr. Farrell says, I enjoy teaching it and the time I spend on it. One of, his fr one of the freshmen in his class also called Ava says, um, I feel more confident to get out of my uncomfortable situations. Additionally, Sarah, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, she's at Fall Sports Awards, um, says that um, she, Leah, Judy, Mercedes, Rojas, and Abby Hayes said, we talked about our experiences in high school and things we wished we'd known when we were freshmen. It was an awesome opportunity to create a culture of positivity and inclusivity so the underclassmen know they are safe and welcome at our school. We also reviewed ways to direct, delegate, and distract situations that are unsafe via the green dot message. Continuing ways that our, that our upperclassmen and underclassmen interact, as well as cultivating a family-like atmosphere, is incredibly important, and I'm grateful to have taken part. This Thursday, Ms. Gwen Shotwell, who is the president and COO of SpaceX, will be coming back to LHS. And students are extremely excited about it. Um, all students will see and hear Ms. Shotwell's presentation as she speaks about her journey and experiences to tell her where she is today. Some exciting highlights about her is that she's an LHS alumni and she graduated in 1982. In 2020, she was selected by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people. In 2018, she was selected by Forbes as one of the top 50 women in technology. And she's an inspiration to many students, and they all look forward to seeing her. Unfortunately, this event is closed to the public and is only available for students and staff. But this event was possible by LHS computer science teacher, Ms. Teresa Elmore, who sent Ms. Shotwell an email a few years ago asking if she could speak to LHS students. We're all really excited for it. Um, fall sports have come to our app, and fall sports awards are we're happening tonight at LHS to celebrate the accomplishments of our fall athletes. Sarah, who's al Sarah also went to state this weekend, which went really great. And she mentioned that it was a bittersweet moment and it was a result of lots of hard work. She says, I'm incredibly proud of my team. Thank you. One, top one topic of much debate among LHS students has been the new final schedule where every, every class has a mandatory final of some sort, whether it be an actual exam or a culminating project. The schedule lasts over two days, which odd, with odd periods having their finals on the first day and evens on the second and a built-in lunch period each day. Many students wish we could go back to the schedule during the 2021 to 2022 school year where we had a normal schedule during finals week and teachers could choose whether or not they wanted to have finals. However, this schedule was not without its drawbacks since teachers who chose to give finals often extended over multiple days, which stressed out students more. This change could be seen as a fix to the problem, but for students whose teachers wouldn't give finals if they were optional, it would add a bit of stress. 
About the new schedule, junior Hope Wagner said, it's new for me because of COVID, so I've never experienced finals, so I'm nervous about it. The schedule doesn't seem too confusing, which is nice, but I'll have a feeling I'll get pretty stressed out when it happens. That tends to be the general viewpoint of all non-seniors at LHS, since they've never had to do a real finals week. Even seniors, including myself, are pretty nervous because the last time we had finals was like almost three years ago, which is kind of nuts. Um, I know for me, I don't entirely know what to expect in the coming finals week, even though I've been through it once before. Overall, we are bracing ourselves for the new schedule, but we're pretty accepting of it and optimistic that it won't be too bad. On the flip side, one thing bringing- Can I just clarify one point on that before you go on? Um, For the final schedule, it is not required that teachers give a culminating assessment. It's required that all students attend, but teachers could give a paper final, a project, or just Oh, I meant by culminating um, project. My bad. Sorry. Oh, no. But it could also just be continued instruction, especially in year-long classes. Oh, my bad. I was under the impression that it had to be some sort of culminating experience. Thanks. We, We encourage those. Yeah. Have to be. Okay. On the flip side, one thing bringing much relief to seniors is that the November 1st deadline is up for college applications. Leading up to the first, our class was a buzz talking about which schools we were applying to, how many essays we had left to write, which college admissions portals was the most confusing. In my opinion, it was definitely UIUC. The CRC was always full of seniors needing help with various things like essays, filling out the Common App or supplemental materials. It really was a great resource to have, especially in that week leading up to the very stressful November 1st deadline. I know I still have a lot more schools to go, but it's a relief to know that I've made it through the first round. Lots of my friends have entirely finished applying, which must be a really nice spot to be in. What lies ahead really is just a waiting game. Most of us have nothing more we can do before decisions for the early section come out, but it's certainly a stressful wait. Senior Omar Mahmoud talked about being nervous to find out which of his early schools he got into, but fairly optimistic and glad that the first deadline passed. However, things aren't entirely calm just yet. The CRC is still full of people in the lead up to the January regular decision deadline, and some people are applying to schools with November 15th early deadlines, so that's still a, that's, so that's still some work to do. We're really glad that we have resources like the CRC to help with anything we may need or even just a quiet place to work on our applications. In late October, LHS stage players put on Grease for their fall musical. I had the opportunity to go and see it, and it was honestly amazing. I'm an avid theater fan, and every part of the show was so good. The lead actors, Sophia Rines and Chris Montero, did a great job, as well as every single supporting actor. Two real standout performances were Louis Perry as Kanicki singing Greased Lightning and Isabel Rodolfi as Rizzo th- singing There Are Worse Things I Could Do. Every part of the show was phenomenal, from the chamber orchestra to the set design to the costumes. I honestly could go on all day about every part I liked about Grease. <laughs> But I'm really looking forward to see what stage players has in store for future performances like the winter play, the freshman and sophomore play, and the 1X this December. School field trips have also started to come back following the COVID-19 pandemic, which is really exciting for many students. Most people at LHS have never really been on a field trip, and those who have haven't been on one since freshman year. This includes travel field trips as well for some classes and clubs where students are able to stay overnight in different cities for conferences or other educational travel plans. One field trip coming up real soon is the Dunn Museum in Libertyville to celebrate Native American Heritage Month this Saturday. The trip is open to all students and seeks to educate more students about Native American culture and history, specifically with a local angle on it. Another trip are some Latin students being able to go to Italy this spring break. The Italy trip has been a core part of the Latin curriculum as long as I've been at LHS and probably even before, so I know a lot of students are really excited to go. As a Latin student myself, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to learn more about the culture and language I studied for three years and getting that firsthand experience. LHS's orchestra is also going to Paris this year and will be given the opportunity to perform there. It's a great opportunity to learn more about another culture, as well as performing in an entirely new area. But of course, the most important thing, according to senior Jeanette Jenkinson, is planning elaborate outfits for when they explore the city. (laughs) This past week, this LHS school paper, Drops of Ink, went to St. Louis for the National Student Press Association annual conference. As a member of Drops of Ink, I was able to attend this conference, and it was super fun and a great learning and bonding experience. We got to go to various aspects of 
various classes on all different aspects of journalism that interested us. I was able to attend classes on almost any topic I wanted to explore from law to journalistic writing to editing. As we continue to recover from the impacts of COVID, I would totally recommend expanding these opportunities for us to explore and experience places that enrich our view of the world around us and encourage us to dream and expand our perspective. One new addition to LHS's efforts for cultural awareness have been unity lunches. These are days where students can spend their lunch periods playing games, talking, and learning about various cultures that exist within the LHS community. The first unity lunch this year was held by LASO, the Latin American Student Organization, and was for Hispanic Heritage Month back in September. Students of all backgrounds got to come together to learn about Hispanic culture. This month, there will be another Unity Lunch for National Native American Heritage Month held tomorrow. During every lunch period, students can go to room 006 to learn about Native American culture. Activities include tasting honey from the Iowa tribe, learning which foods are essential in Native American communities, and watching a short documentary about Potawatomi, young women, and hoop dancing. Lots of students are really excited for this lunch, but one small concern that has arisen that has arisen among students is that the school isn't providing lunch for students who want to go to the Unity Lunch, and students would really like to see some of the money for the Unity Lunch going towards giving people participating actual food. Another opportunity for students is the Dare to Empower Lunch this Wednesday, open to all female identifying students. This lunch is meant to help female students find their voices and learn how to be assertive as well as ex discussing their experiences as, as women at LHS. This lunch has been going on for a few years, sponsored by the club Advocates, and it's been a great opportunity for female students to talk and bond over shared experiences. Overall, these lunches have been a really positive experience. I haven't been able to attend one since I don't have a full lunch period, but all of my friends who have gone have had a great time and learned a lot. I hope LHS will continue to sponsor opportunities like this for students part of underrepresented groups to bond and other students to learn more about other cultures. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. My name is Hari Jun. It's wonderful to be here with you guys tonight. November has been a very eventful month. To start off, the seniors had their November 1st deadline, and with all the anxiety that built up leading up to the deadline, there has been an evident decline in nervousness regarding college admissions amongst many seniors. As more time has passed since November 1st, the CRC isn't overflowing with seniors on a day-to-day -day basis, which is definitely getting a bit of getting used to. And with cap and gown signups that took place on November 3rd, seniors were hit with the reality of high school graduation. For some, this was very sentimental, while some, like Rebecca Broomer, felt that it was a clear indication of her being a step closer to quote-unquote freedom and felt very excited about it. Congratulations to October's Cougar Class Act recipients, Charles Karsten, Parab Aurora, Joseph Jarzebek, Campo Lawrence, Lauren Bowers, Lucas Kuden, Arielle Smith, Alexandra Barden, Olivia Lawhorn, and Anaya Binal. Way to go, Cougars. In honor of the veterans, CrossFit completed a special Veterans Day Hero workout on November 11th called CHAD. The workout was led by Ms. Kalinske and Mr. Schroeder and consisted of a thousand box step-ups that were completed as a team, partner, or individually in honor of Navy SEAL Chad Wilkinson, who took his own life on October 28, 2018, due to the effects of many deployments and injuries. More than 45 students and 18 staff members participated in the workout, and it was wonderful to see Vernon Hills High School actively honor a veteran. As students have accustomed to the school year, they have grown to be more comfortable with the school. This is great. However, there has been a number of students that don't throw away their garbage after staying in areas of the school. This has especially been an issue in the UC and the theaters, where there's garbage lying around that hasn't been taken care of. Along with that, some bathrooms aren't in the most pristine condition, with some stalls not having any toilet paper for multiple days in a row. This was noted in the women's restrooms. Vernhill's high school choirs held their fall concert on November 10th, and it was a fabulous way to kickstart this school year's concerts. This concert in particular was very special because the Sign Language Club was able to perform the piece Heartbeat with the choir and by signing the lyrics of the song. The song conveyed the message that one must think before speaking and that they should treat others the, the way that they would like to be treated, and seeing the Sign Language Club convey this message was very impactful and created a sense of unity with the choir. On November 12th, select Vernhills High School fine arts students in orchestra, band, and choir went to ILMEA. 
This year, ILMEA took place at New Trier High School, and the day was full of beautiful music. Senior Jeffrey Brahms noted that it was an incredibly rewarding way to make music and celebrate talent with peers that he wouldn't normally have the chance to work with. The month of November has been incredibly eventful, and Vern Hills High School is, is excited for more to come. Good evening. This past month has offered a number of opportunities for students to newly express their voices. Vernon Hills government classes encourage seniors to register to be election judges at the midterm polls. With about 30 in attendance, students were led through training at the high school before serving as election judges across the community. Senior Joanne Doe described the experience as, quote, eye-opening. Though she didn't enjoy waking up early, seeing a line of voters waiting at 6 a.m. was a motivator, showing how willing people were to participate. Navigating the intricacies of ballot verification was a tiring experience, but one that Joanne recommends to her peers. Without the incentive from government classes, seniors Preston Wright and Rahil Sheff would likely not have taken part in judging. So through this experience, many Cougars had the ability to become more deeply civically engaged and contribute to the democratic process. The five performance run of Cinderella had many VHHS students joining in song and instrument to execute a successful fall musical season. As the show's house manager, I can guarantee that the musical was well received by audiences and actors corroborated that they enjoyed the performances just as much. Joc Jocelyn Betterelli, a senior who performed as Cinderella, called the show's run perfect and said that she relished in the audience's reactions to different sections of the show, which made her happy and realized that all the hard work paid off. While the conclusion of this show has Jocelyn sad and nostalgic, the Backlight Theater Company is already gearing up for its next show. Lily Zartler, Backlight's historian, says that auditions for Murder on the Orient Express facilitated a supportive environment where no matter how much experience someone has, there are always people cheering them on, and was encouraged by the super high underclassmen turnout. On Halloween, Backlight volunteers walked door to door in every Deer Path neighborhood asking for non-perishables people were willing to donate, according to Annette Vaisberg, who organized the annual initiative. She took pride in the hundreds of canned food items which filled the volunteers' cars that they donated to the Vernon Township Food Pantry. Beyond theater, all students were able to raise their voices in the panorama survey sent out on November 2nd. While many thought that it was important to share their opinions, some were confused by the presence of pandemic return-related questions that seemed out of date. Overall, Cougars are entering the winter months with no shortage of school spirit. VHHS has become a hub of pride and victory, marked in the new awards and medals from postseason games, races, and tournaments. As fall sports wrapped up this past month, teams began to wholeheartedly put their month's worth of hard work to use, and it paid off. For the girls' cross-country team, getting to state was a feat in itself made possible by all the hard work and striving. At state, the team had battled against conditions far from ideal, fighting just as they had all season. For senior Raina Hill, the ending to her high school cross-country career was a bittersweet one, defined by all the memories, challenges, lifelong friends, victories, and losses. Being there myself, I can second that. Not only am I a runner, I'm also learning how to be a teammate and a leader. For the volleyball's girls team, both talent and hard work came together at a powerful intersection, leading them to break VHHS history as regional champions. In swimming, both Kate Williams and Izzy Ramos conquered their way to state this past weekend. Additionally, Unified placed second in state after a strongly fought battle against LHS. This month has also been one of a lot of reflection, change, and religious celebration. For much of the Hindu community at the school, Diwali is a crucial celebration. According to sophomore Anya Gupta, packed days full of celebration and tests have become increasingly hard to manage. Celebrations she wants to feel fully rejoiced and present in, become more stressful when the back of her mind is more preoccupied with the homework she has to get done and the test she has the next day. Left having to wing tests and quizzes because she couldn't study made her feel further behind. And this has made both me and her wonder why not give the school day off for the holiday. Gupta wants to be seen by the school because she knows, quote, historically the school hasn't celebrated a lot of Hindu holidays, end quote. For Ashley Shoemaker, being seen is also a very important topic. As a Native American in a very small minority of the school, she wants to both protect and educate people on the tragedy, devastation, and stories of her history. 
This past week, in celebration of Native American Heritage Month, BHHS's Equity Coordinator Tara Young and Ms. Shoemaker organized a screening titled Warrior Tradition. According to Ashley Shoemaker, it was a good first step, one that she was glad to see was proactively connecting people to awareness. At the screening, Ashley and her mom dressed in traditional garments and helped lead discussions on the different elements of their culture and identity, from their jewelry to hair to the genocide that happened against Native Americans. But she also expressed that this couldn't mark the end of taking actionable steps, which made me wonder, how can we ensure that students, staff, and the larger VHHS community are being educated on the full stories of Native American history and what what can we do as a community to help support Native American reservations? Just like Ashley Shoemaker, there's a lot of other VHHS clubs that are making strides to make an impact, one of which is FMPA. Just a few weeks ago, the club Future Medical Professionals of America joined HOSA, a career-oriented organization aimed with the goal to help students delve deeper into their exploration of the medical field through competitions, written reports, and research, just as FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America, does with the business field. Thus far, about 35 people have joined, and according to Sai Gojanini, it will help it will give a space for eager and curious students to explore the field, an opportunity that no other club offers. Additionally, Dare to Empower, VHHS's Feminist Advocacy Club hosted a self-defense class teaching students valuable defensive skills. Senior Morgan Advance said, it was comforting to know that under a dangerous situation, she'd be equipped with those skills. However, it troubles me that I, as well as so many other members of the Dare to Empower Club, felt it was necessary to have a self-defense class to begin with, especially considering we live in a safe neighborhood. Not only does it show the concerns of girls in our school, it also exposes the larger inequities that may make it unsafe for a female to be walking by herself. This month, we've made strides to lessen those inequities. For example, the equity leadership team is amidst efforts to create a workshop on microaggressions for freshman transition classes. Being a part of the effort myself and being able to work with other staff, I've felt both inspired and eager to turn a large idea for change into something actionable. Last month, I touched upon the need to address microaggressions and we've taken small steps towards that. However, I, as well as my peers, are looking for how we can make required equity training sessions at least once a semester for teachers and students, teaching students and staff about how to teach, act, and live equitably and respectfully. And maybe we could even start doing so starting next semester. Not only is respect and equity a pillar of VHHS, it's a pillar of successful and mindful people. And every day we're trying to build a population of students and staff that embody that positive message. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your reports. Um, and now we have uh, arrived at the good news portion of our meeting. Yes, some of the things on my list, the students already covered. So thank you for including uh, some good news of your peers. I will continue on with the good news and acknowledge that the D128 Unified Soccer teams finished first and second at this month's state championships. The LHS Storm is the state championship team with a 5-4 win over Nequa Valley, and the Vernon Hills Storm finished in second place. Team members for Libertyville are Henry Bownis, Samuel Brown, Graham, S S excuse me, Sizka, um, Zachary Gilfand, Gavin Goldberg, Daniel Granados, Noah Hewitt, Elizabeth Karsten, <clears throat> Chase Miller, Hazel Morales, Shannon Murphy, Ben Newtall, Parker Newtall, and Megan Roberts. And for Vernon Hills and the second place team, we have Rachel Ackerman, Sophie Ackerman, Liam Angelos, Luke Angelos, Morgan Bedell, David Dubois, Albina Giza, Xavier Granados, Murray Hennigan, Joseph Mahler, Chris Morrison, Ben Peterson, Mackenzie Runke, and Haley Spitek. The teams are coached by Andy Compton, Allison Wilkin, and Sean Kelly. And I believe we even celebrated with the band marching around the school at LHS last week. So a good time was had by all. Um, 
D-128 was happy to welcome back senior residents from the community to Vernon Hills on November 3rd for a dinner and musical performance of Cinderella. That tradition had to be canceled or revised during the pandemic, so it was exciting to welcome back our special guests for this much-loved tradition. We look forward to hosting seniors next month at Libertyville High School. And finally, tomorrow, November 15th, is School Board Member Day in Illinois. Each year on this day, we honor those citizens who devote their time and energy to ensure the successful education of our children and our future leaders. The theme for 2022 is Partners in Excellence. And on behalf of the district, I would like to say thank you to all of our school board members and note that we truly value your partnership. I don't think that Iman knew this, but she brought cookies to celebrate. So we all received a thank treat you um, as well as I have uh, certificates to recognize each of you for another fabulous year of service. So, um, and I think Mary would appreciate once I give you your certificates, if we could get a quick photo. Let's speed this photo thing up. No, no, you can win. Thank you. Just don't smile open. <laughs> so you don't have words. I know. Oh, oh, sure. I'm sorry, mom. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Everyone thanks. knows. Everyone knows exactly who the Philly board member is. Can we take a bow? I don't know. Are we holding Gisa? I bring a knife. I'm proud. Yes. Oh. Like? Thank you. More after they got some down. That concludes, oh, that concludes our good news. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So we're going to proceed to our consent vote agenda. These are routine items that we have discussed extensively in committee. Um, may I please have a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as, oh, I'm sorry, I need to ask, is there anyone on the board that wishes to remove anything from the consent agenda? No. Okay, seeing none, may I please uh, have a motion? to approve the um, consent vote agenda. Rooney, so moved. Thank you. Can I have a second, please? Carmichael, second. Great, I have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Motion passes, thank you. Moving on to action items, um, I will turn it over um, to um, Chairman Batson to take us through the items that have come out of the uh, program and personnel. Okay, thank you. Um, first item on here is employment of employees. These are uh, uh, a couple um, additional uh, hires um, uh, since the last, uh, since our committee meeting, uh, we had a few in the consent agenda but uh these were new ones since then so um we'll call for a um, motion and a second for this hessel motion to approve the employment of employees as presented Kukarni, second any questions or comments from the board okay hearing none can we have a roll call please benjamin aye carmichael aye hessel aye Kulkarni. aye rooney Aye. Batson. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Um, next item on the agenda is um, one that's been discussed quite a bit. I, I'll turn this over to uh, get some background information on the uh, community education program. Thank you. Um, so the 
information is uh, on the board agenda in a memo that we discussed last week at program and personnel um, committee meeting. And it's something that we've been exploring as administration, you know, looking at the program and how that aligns with our District 128 mission and vision. Um, and it is, you know, a long standing program. It's uh, the community education has been in place for 74 years. Um, you know, over those years, there has been changes to the program, um, offering classes online to in person, um, trying it different ways, um, offering many different courses, um, putting course limits in place um, or um, minimums in place in order to try to, you know, um, run the courses um, and be fiscally responsible, worked with local companies. And some of the courses actually are actually offered out in the community. So we do all the sign up, but then they're at a place. So, it, you know, for example, they might be um, uh, Glassworks, a uh, local company. So we have all the sign up, but it's done outside. So it's not in our uh, facility. Um, some of our more well attended classes um, <clears throat> tend to be, you know, um, some of the baking or cooking classes, although there are still some baking and cooking classes that are offered and they're online. But because of our, and you guys, we toured our consumer uh, education um, classes last week because of our facilities, uh, you know, we're able to offer some of those courses or some of the dance courses or some fitness courses um, and woodworking course um, because, again, of the facilities. Um, but again, we try to make changes to these courses. Um, we just, you know, fiscally, it's been uh, difficult. Now, we... Just to give you a little bit more background and, and, and some of the questions, I think, or some of the comments that, you know, that came up, you know, our focus really is primarily on um, our high school students. And that's what we, you know, focus up, focus on, but we still have some offerings for adults. So we do some programs from Master Swim. Um, we do partnerships with Vernon Hills Park District where their swim program comes into our pool. Um, in the past, we um, have offered uh, the track at Libertyville and Vernon Hills to a lo local running club. Um, we have EL courses. Again, we don't run them. We offer our facility here, graduate courses, um, rentals for companies in the community. So we have a lot of things that we have partnered with. And so, uh, you know, looking at, you know, what can we do moving forward with, um, you know, community education? Our goal is to work with our local government entities to, you know, offer some of our more well-attended courses. And we've had conversation. I had some follow-up again today with Village of Libertyville um, and Vernon Hills, you know, some of those courses and what they could. We would be willing to open our doors. Um, and I think, you know, looking at Master Swim, um, you, you know, it's 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 our program. So we run it. We hire the coaches. Um, we might be able to look at um, North, uh, West wind ensemble and how we can offer that still because of our facilities. So right now there's 43 members signed up for Northwest wind, wind ensemble. That's our biggest class, but it's not really a class. It's a little bit different than class, but it's something maybe, you know, we can maybe run like a master swim program. So our recommendation is to finish the community education program. Um, at the end of June, but that gives us from now until the end of June to figure out some of those logistics on some of these more uh, well-attended courses, Northwest Wind Ensemble to woodworking to some of our cooking courses. Um, and I know that working again with the Village of Libertyville, um, um, Village of uh, Vernon Hills, their park district, and even the libraries. There's a lot of offerings, I think, that adults have, um, but we're willing to open up our facilities and, and work with them. And again, we have courses already set up for second semester that we want to offer, but then because we're not planning for offering anything in the future, our staff will be working with, you know, um, those government entities on getting that situated for basically um, the fall moving forward. We really don't offer much over the summer for our adult heads. And you could see, you know, part of it, obviously, yes, it, it is a financial decision. If you look at the past, you know, four years, um, you know, the expenditures and, and the deficit really, you know, you're talking a million dollars over, you know, four years time. Which is not a few dollars. Not a few as, dollars. As mentioned in public comment. So we have that in a slide that we could put up by chance. Just 
I don't have it on a slide. But I, That's okay. You so have, this we is have your presentation from last week. It's on. It, it's yeah. uh, it's in the board packet. In the board packet. I know. Yeah. I'm just yeah, wanting the public yeah, orders, yeah, like myself yeah. who like to see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, again, this was a you know a difficult decision, I think, because again of the history of community education. Um, but it allows us, I think, to you know focus on some of the things that we're looking at with our strategic mission. But again. Our focus second semester is to take these programs and work with our other, you know, entities on trying to, um, you know, continue some of our more well attended programs. My my understanding is this is sort of like uh, to use a um, overused phrase, a, a chicken or the egg kind of thing. We we really couldn't move forward partnering with people to try to take over the the real the, the very well attended and the very popular programs until we take some action to say, no, we really want to end this at some point in time. But, you know, it, 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 to me, it's, um, it's inevitable that the, the program can't continue like it is. And especially considering, you know, the, the almost quarter million dollar um, loss just this past year. So, and, and right now in the, in the fall out of our programs, uh, I think almost, um, I would say almost a third are offered online. And so, you know, that's through ed to go or you, you know, you got class programs. So there's still, oppor you know, still opportunities for people to find, uh, you know, those courses online. Um, we really just were advertising and then people would go in and sign up. I recognize that we're taking away a service that we've offered to the community over time. Um, if there weren't those other venues, and let's not forget places like CLC, we have a, a fantastic community college that people can access for a variety of learning experiences. For very little money. For very little money. Um, but our responsibility is to our students. We all took an oath to manage taxpayer money properly and continuing to support a program that's losing close to a quarter of a million dollars a year for me personally would not be accomplishing that oath would not be being faithful to it so i i like that we are actively trying to work with other partners libraries etc to make sure that we fill those gaps and offer our facilities where we can for the ones that very clearly people are passionate about and and i i support and understand that but at the end of the day, our oath is to spending the money on our students. I would agree. Um, I'm not going to belabor it because I want to amplify everything that you said. And as a taxpayer, I think it would be irresponsible to continue diverting funds that we could be spending on students and our buildings, which clearly um, have infrastructure needs that are significant and the strategic plan. Um, so. Uh, I agree with you. I understand the concerns of our community and um, appreciate how much some of these programs mean to them, but I think we can continue to um, help facilitate the transition because of the very long transition that we're looking at. Um, and I said I wasn't going to belabor, and I'm belaboring. So <laughs> thank you for your I'll comments, and I agree. Can I get a point of clarification? Was it possible for the public to see uh our discussion that occurred last week yes it actually it, that is a factual point of order um on friday or saturday when i looked for the video because i had a community member reach out to me to ask about it mm -hmm. i was able to immediately uh again either friday or saturday find the recording of monday's committee meeting and direct them to the 30 minute mark where our discussion took place um, I also um, note that the information that was provided in our packet with the financial information and the decline in enrollment and how few taxpayers actually take advantage of this, that was all in the packet. And I'm not sure that everybody saw it or knew where to look. Yeah, for. well, the original was it the packet was released on Friday. It was not in the packet, but then that was corrected. And we did. Some people that reached out today, we um, I know Mary reached back out to people and directed them to. Um, the memo from me. So that originally was not in there. But it was also that same memo was in the committee agenda 
last for last week's meeting also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just concerned that we're we may be rushing. That people haven't had an opportunity to really digest this, especially since, you know, so many of them said the same thing that I did. Are there ways that we can partner? At, but I think people want some assurances, like they don't want to be left hanging. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to tell them, yeah, this is going to happen and we're going to partner with, but then things won't be available. And I think no matter what we do, not everything would be available anyway. Like even if we decided that we were going to keep the program at a loss, we couldn't continue to operate at that level of loss. It's just not responsible. But even if we were to look at it to change how we were doing things, can, can we in any way provide any assurances to the community that some of the things that we've heard about tonight that they love, those things will be picked up by someone and I guess the other thing that I'm asking is, are, is there any reason that we should not delay until the next meeting? Like, do we have to vote tonight because there is something that requires us to put something in motion that allows something to happen? Or could we delay another two weeks? Because we have both the, the committee meeting and the general meeting on the 12th. Yeah, early in so that we could maybe reach out and actually get some feedback from those because I know that you've reached out to them, but I don't know what kind of uh, interest level they have that would allow us to assuage some fears of the people in our community who feel like they've just gotten the rug taken out from under them. Um, so I'm, I'm asking, I guess, two things. Can we provide them any assurances? And secondly, can we delay a couple of weeks? Is there anything stopping us from doing that? And I had sort of the same question as I was listening to the comments too, because typically we have two weeks between our regular meeting and our committee meetings. And this time we just have one. So it's possible people just didn't get time to read and absorb everything we discussed. And second is also, we like to offer these through other channels, but is there any way that we can delay that, this discussion until we get a little further in that, in that um, opportunity seeking? And I think there's some, some was, programs such as the SWIM program, right. the North Suburban Wind Ensemble that really rely on our facilities that maybe we can come up with some, some ways to help facilitate that that's not under the guise of this, um, the current program. And we can make that assurance now. Like we can say, given somebody operating it, we will provide you a facility, mm -hmm. but we won't necessarily have the personnel there to arrange it, uh, you know, do whatever the financing is, collect fees, whatnot. I think, you know, to answer one of your questions on, you know, can we have guarantees on class? I don't think there's any guarantees even on the classes that we offer. So to give you an idea, you know, this semester where we offered 220, but 100 and uh, sorry, 230, and it looks like 120 were canceled. So, you know, even, even that saying, hey, we guarantee where, you know, this class is going to be available. It all depends on, you know, the number sure. of signing up. Um, but I, I mean, you could take, we could take our more well-attended courses, you know, this semester or last semester, and I can, you know, take those or the ones that we're running and, and talk to the park district at Vernon Hills and talk to the village. From I'd talking like with the park district director from mm -hmm. Vernon Hills this weekend, they are interested in, you know, um, shepherding in some of the courses that fit with their mission. So he said, you know, we feel very comfortable offering something like cooking or some dance or things that really fall in line with the mission of a park district. But some of our other programmings wouldn't be appropriate for them. And that might be something that we then work with the library or something else. So I think we were anticipating at time in the spring to have those conversations with the different entities. I don't think we could have a... Uh, legitimate plan by December, but we could definitely have some groundwork laid that could give you an idea of um, what each entity is interested in and what the timeline might look like. 
that that might give you know not only some time to get some of those things together but also some time for the public to have some additional time to digest and and respond we had one of the the student reps wanted to make a comment i just wanted to briefly note um while the attention to divesting funds for students is greatly appreciated i wanted to clarify that um a portion of those community programs, especially the North Suburban Wind Ensemble, has representation by Vernon Hills students. So those two categories would not necessarily be mutually exclusive. In, Good point. Yeah. Yeah. And that certainly would be one of the popular programs that we'd be looking to transition to another entity so that it would not have to cease. Mm -hmm. Alternately, is there any sense in gradually scaling back the program semester after semester and just kind of seeing which community entities were willing to take on said programs kind of little by little? Um, I don't know if that's really feasible, but just kind of giving, given the community attachment to so many of these programs, is it something that we could manage kind of um, incrementally over time? almost like a take back of community <laughs> programs to the other community entities versus just doing this cold, hard stop. Um, I don't know if that's I feasible. Think I think your difficulty would be that you still have, uh, you know, so your major costs or your staffing. So, so if you decrease the amount of classes moving forward, you're still spending you know, the same amount of money and, and decreasing um, and that, you know, that was part of our recommendation why it was to continue to end it at the end of June, because then you're really looking at from January to June that we have two staff members and, and, and me really working with our government entities on transferring that stuff. But, and, and we can start on that stuff, it, it, you know, actually as soon as the board makes a decision and start that process. Um, and I realized with the November, we just talked about last week, and it's less than a week. Um, with the net, normally, again, as uh, Sanal said, that's normally two weeks to process and answer questions. But if we delay it till December, we're still set up for second semester. It's just then, you know, us starting that process um, after December board meeting. And just to reiterate that, the gradual release of courses, the individual courses themselves. We try to make sure that the enrollees pay for that instructor, that two to $250,000 are all of the overhead costs. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be really clear with that, yeah, that, so that pulling back a away class is, right, would actually just, make yeah. the ones we run more expensive per class. Right. That actually makes a lot of sense. Thank you for clarifying. So I think there was one other question Don you asked, which is by when does this decision have to be made is, is one. And is that decision necessary for us to start looking at the alternative options or can those be done in parallel? So I think the only issue is if, if you don't make a decision and we do all this work and then we decide not, you know, to discontinue the program that would be the difficulty is if the board but looking at i think timeline if there was a decision in december i think just because of the winter break and other stuff i, I mean are we going to get on this tomorrow and start on that process you know with a lot of other things going on it would probably you know i don't think the december would you know but I do think there is time sensitive things with us starting to build a budget for next year. Mm -hmm. Right. This is a, a has been a large expense. Yep. So we need to know where those funds are going to be used. And then if if you do decide, we can divert those funds toward other emerging needs. Yeah. Yep. I think I'm what I'm hearing is we realize that the program can't continue as it is. There's just some concern about some of these very popular programs, some of these things that we could. And maybe we're the only place to to house them, such as the North Suburban Symphony or Wind Ensemble, that um, you know that we have some plans in place and we have some understanding of how we can help continue to facilitate those those uh, very popular programs and partner with our our you know other community partners rather than just you know dropping everything and letting people fend for themselves. So I think I'm, I, I'm I think speaking for myself. Yeah. Though, yeah. No, 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 no. And that's what I'm saying. And that's what I'm saying is, is I think our intention is, 
we know the program's not going to continue, but we want to make sure that those those programs have a new home or a new process or a new th thing to be able to support those community members that have been so loyal to these programs for so many years. So I wonder what um, my fellow board members and our administrators who um, guide us so well think about asking for a motion to table this mm -hmm. until the December committee and board meetings. The motion would be to postpone. The motion would be to postpone? Yeah. Tabling means you're just going to do it later in the same meeting. Postponing gives you a date. Thank you. Until the next year. Postpone. I, I will instead ask for a motion to postpone it to the committee meetings. That will give um, a little bit of time, um, most importantly, I think, to allow the community to digest the information that they may not have had the chance to digest. Uh, gave Brian a chance to do a little bit more legwork on the programs that we've identified an interest in facilitating the continuation of through a different community partner um, with the understanding that this program can't continue. I would support that. Great. So can I please have a motion to postpone this until the November committee, December, uh, sorry, the December uh, committee and board meeting, Rooney. which will happen on the same day. Rooney, so moved. Carmichael, second. Thank you. Any and just to be clear, the, the actual um, motion will be, uh, the vote will be at the, the board, board meeting, meeting, not the committee. Right. Correct. Just to be well, we'll probably yeah. discuss it we'll at have the committee and then, the committee meeting have, and then yes. vote uh, at the board meeting. Which happened the same. Yeah, okay. which is, yeah, they're all compressed. Yes, because December, we do it on the same night. Right. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Um, I have a motion in a second. Do we have any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Take your time. I did. Carmichael, second. Carmichael. Aye. Essel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Great. Okay, that motion passes. And um, thank you for your patience and understanding and more to come on that topic. Uh, thank you to our administrators for their yes. flexibility in that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. thank you. Um, next coming out of the program of personnel is the uh, BHHS community liaison position. Yes, so as uh, we reviewed last week, this is um, being brought forth by um, collaboration between our district office, Dr. Gilliam, who in turn worked with his leadership team um, in review of our Title I funding and identifying a way to make um, the best use of the funding. Um, and from that came the community and family liaison position, which would serve um, um, as a point person to identify the um, most appropriate ways to support our at-risk students. Can we have a um, motion, please, for this one? Benjamin, I move to approve the new VHHS community liaison position. Hessel, second. Any further discussion, comment? Yeah, questions? we should we should acknowledge mm -hmm. where the the funds are coming from to be sure that people understand mm -hmm. that this is coming from federal grant funds yeah, and so that correct. we are yes. not actually creating a position that we're just spending more money now. Right. Like at one point, one of our letters in said, you know, how can you hire this new position and you'll kill this program at the same time? Funds are coming from different places for these. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a federal grant that we have uh, started to receive two years ago. And so um, it is something that we will continue to receive and it'll fund, it'll fund the position. And Thank the you. funds are earmarked for at-risk students to, to be able to support this type of program. So Correct. And it is a use it or lose it type of thing. If we do not use these federal grant funds, we just lose them. Correct. We get a small rollover, but we don't. But we, we lose the rest. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. I just have, uh, would ask you to clarify one more thing. And that is um, uh, Vernon Hills High School is the one, is the school that qualifies for Title I. So if you can just kind of explain that for the population here. Sure. So. Title I dollars are generated by our students who are on free and reduced lunch. However, when the application is completed, we have to rank the schools by average poverty levels. So when we do that, um, 
um, the average poverty level for the district is 8%. So both of the schools would have to have a minimum of 8% average poverty level to be able to use the funding at that school. So currently LHS's poverty level is about 3.4%. And um, Vernon Hills High School is a little over 11%. So that when we rank the schools, it tells us that LHS is not eligible to receive the funding. Therefore, we have to spend all of it at Vernon Hills High School. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments, questions? This is good work. Thank you. Uh, could we have a roll call, please? Essel. Aye. Kokarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay, motion passes. And the last item coming out of the uh, Program and Personnel Committee is the 22-23 uh, superintendent goals. Right. And as we talked about last week, um, we've been working on these for a while, so I appreciate all the feedback. Um, and even last week, there was one new addition added, so I just wanted to bring your attention to that. Um, there was a fifth goal um, that is linked to our innovation. Um, one of the things that we realized is that the other foundational goals all had links to either a financial goal or a board relationship goal or something like that. So we rounded it out and added one more, um, not fully developed yet, but one to make sure that while we're moving forward with our strategic plan, that we continue to foster that spirit of innovation and you know, really value new ideas and new ways of solving problems for students. Good idea. Okay. And we need a, uh, a motion. We're gonna approve these tonight for, your, for this year. Okay, so can we have a uh, motion and a second, please? Move to approve the 22, sorry, Carmichael. <laughs> Move to approve the 22-23 superintendent goals as presented. Rooney second. Okay, any further comments, discussion? We've been talking about these for a long time, as you mentioned, and these are all good uh, good goals. So we look forward to uh, seeing uh, some of the results of these. So. And if I could add the next step in the process, since we're um, when we approach mid-year, Dr. Herman will do a self-evaluation in Super Eval, the software that mm -hmm. we implemented uh, last year, uh, last school year, this calendar year. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll all have the opportunity um, to make comments and match them against um, the targets. Mm -hmm. Okay. That should be coming to you prior to winter break. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Anything else? We have a roll call, please. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Okay. That motion passes, and that's all the uh, program and personnel items on the agenda. Great, and then we'll turn it over to Casey Rooney to take us through the action items coming out of the Facilities and Finance Committee. All righty. Well, the first one is the 2022 tax levy. Um, we've discussed this this evening, as well as February, multiple board meetings. Obviously, this is one of the most important things we do as board, um, is make sure that our schools are properly funded. Dan, do I need to turn it over to you? Oh, you want to turn on that other presentation I got for you? Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. The forty-page one. Um, <laughs> Let's do it again. Let's do it one more time. Yeah. This is the the I I can't I I can't say this any more seriously. This single decision um, will have the most significant impact on the district's long-term financial stability. This is very significant. And the importance the is not lost on us. Um, point of clarification, Dan, do I need to, when asking for the motion, do I need to uh, reference the dollar amount or? Uh, you don't, you don't have to. Okay. Nope. Just it's whatever, whatever it has, it's written there. Okay. Then I'd like to ask for a motion to approve and adopt the 2022 tax levy certificate and included resolutions as presented. Batson, Batson. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, Batson, so move. Second, please. Go got any second. Any discussion? Uh, Any I, more discussion? No discussion. I just want to thank Dan. Um, you do such an excellent job. Yes. Planning this, communicating very um, important and serious financial information in a way that not only we can digest, but the community can digest. Um, your work on the FAQs this year, I thought was especially valuable and uh, we are very grateful for the work that you do. 
And here, here. I'll yep. just make one quick comment. The uh, the TIF uh, uh, district, the TIF uh, program that's coming offline that we're capturing with some of this additional, what looks like um, big increases, but we're really just capturing that. It's been a long time in coming. I've seen that for many, many years. Um, having been, you know, even on prior boards when that was in place and knowing that we've not had access to to that funding for all these years and now we'll be able to capture that. That's a great thing for the district. Yeah. If anyone in the public is looking for those documents and that information, we discussed it in our October committee and board meeting as well as November committee meetings. So there are ample opportunities to uh, find and um, research that information. And will the FAQ possibly be made available on the district website financial department page? It is. It is. Thank you very much. There we go. Thank you, Mary. Any other discussion? All right. Roll call, please. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Motion passes. Good work. Moving on to the fiscal year 2023 state maintenance project grant application. Um, I'm going to turn that over to Dan. Uh, yeah, as discussed last week at the committee, uh, there is another uh, $50,000 matching grant for, uh, it's called the school maintenance project grant. Um, again, this isn't normally considered a every year thing, but it, this is two years in a row now. And uh, so we're uh, excited for this opportunity. Um, so there's uh, $50,000 matching um, from the state, which essentially means you have to do a $100,000 project. The state will match 50,000. Uh, so the project has to be a minimum of 100,000. Um, uh, the funds, it can't be a project that you already have going on. So it can't, the work can't have started. You couldn't have approved any bids, something like that. It has to be preliminary stages. And so I uh, worked with Mark and identified uh, the Vernon Hills roof number 16 that's included there um, is going to be on the list for uh, this summer, which would fall under the category of permanent improvement projects, the different categories from the state. Uh, we don't really have things in those categories that would qualify, um, but we're very, uh, very optimistic that we will be granted this. This is a very um, simple process, uh, but it does involve formal board action and signatures and uploading documents to the state, all of which I believe I've attached for you there. Um, so yeah, we will file this. And if knowing based on how it's worked the last couple of years, usually with grants, you have to spend the money, then you turn it in a expenditure report and then they send you the money. Uh, ISBE usually sends this money right away. So after they approve the grant, usually they send the money pretty quickly. They don't wait for you to ask for an expenditure, which is nice. You don't see that very often. Uh, any um, recent past projects that this grant has funded in our schools come to mind? Uh, yeah, it did roofing uh, last year. I, I I can't remember if I think it was maybe this building. Um, beyond that, I, I don't remember off the top of my head. So, But we have used this federal grant money for projects like this in the past. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We definitely want to take advantage of this opportunity, seeing as how we have no shortage of capital projects that we can use it for. And we're not approving the project per se, no, um, because that still will go Good through point. the normal bid and approval process. Yes, this is just right. the grant, mm -hmm. uh, just the app grant application. Um, once we're approved for that, Mark will get going on other things, and there's other things going. Yeah, so this is yeah, this does not ob obligate the district to actually do the project. This is the application for the grant. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Can I get a motion to approve the fiscal year 23, uh, 2023 state maintenance project grant application as presented? Batson, so moved. Benjamin, second. Any discussion? Further discussion? All right. Can I get a roll call, please, Carol? Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to uh, the next item, uh, NIHIP designee, am I saying that right? Yeah, NIHIP. Um, so this this was something that came, honestly, like right yeah. after we had our committee meeting. So it wasn't able to talk about this in committee, uh, but it is timely, NIHIP. So we are part of a, it's called the North, uh, Northern Illinois Health Insurance uh, Program, which is a, uh, it's a, it's a, 
self self funded pool for insurance. So this is how we provide health insurance for our employees, health and dental insurance, life insurance um, through our employees. The bulk of the benefits that we we provide to our employees is through NIHIP. So it's a pool of several districts, um, a lot in the Chicagoland area, uh, all in the Chicagoland area, um, that pool their resources together uh, and self fund an insurance program rather than paying directly the money. So that means the money that's left over at the end of the year, if there is, the <laughs> claims were bad last year, but other than last year, uh, money that's left over stays within the pool. And so then we get to use that to offset uh, premium increases um, there. So one of one of their bylaws uh, requires districts to designate, um, to officially designate a member to that. And so they're asking districts to do that again. And so typically the designee is, would be the chief school business official, which is what my role is for the district. So they want a primary, desi a primary designee and then an alternate and uh, uh, I want to be the alternate. I'm sure he's oh. clamoring mm -hmm. for the post. How often do we have to renew this? You know, I don't know. Um, it it comes up every couple of years, I believe. Um, it kind of depends on. Uh, it it depends on how I have. And this is only appointing the the designees. It's not renewing NIHIP any contracts or anything that happens nope. elsewhere. Yeah. It's just um, documenting this is going to represent us. Documenting that the board is authorizing this person mm -hmm. to represent yeah. the district. Dan has a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the NIHIP designee resolution as presented? Hessel, so moved. That's in second. Okay. Any further discussion? Right. Thank you, Dan, again, for your time and energy towards an important uh, organization. Carol, roll call, please. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. All right. Motion passes. Moving on to disposal of obsolete equipment. Looks like we have a basketball machine that needs to be disposed of. It's pretty self-explanatory. Dr. Dish. <laughs> yeah. What is it? <laughs> Move to approve the recommended disposal of obsolete equipment go. as listed. Hessel, second. Excellent. Any questions? Conversation? No? All right. Roll call, please. Carmichael. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. All right. Motion passes, and that completes the items that came out of facilities and finance. Great. Thank you to our chair people. Uh, for taking us through our actions for our items for action. Moving on to agenda item number six, we have a presentation for the Illinois School Report Card. I will turn it over to Dr. Sanchez and um, Charlotte. Ames. Ms. Ames. Mm -hmm. yeah. Charlotte Ames. Yeah. I was going to say doctor. I'm like, wait. Oh, yeah. nope. okay, why not? <laughs> not sure. yet. Soon. I don't think I have the authority yeah. to, for that. but I will. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I'm getting punchy. Why not? Well, good evening, and uh, thank you for having us again to talk about our Illinois uh, report card. So last week, we did some report card highlights, some of the main uh, exciting things from our report card. And this week, we will be taking a deep dive into a couple of areas. So our report, our presentation tonight focuses on three main areas. So we will be talking about our academic performance data, uh, the SAT. Uh, which we haven't presented on yet. We'll be talking about some of our achievement gaps, and then we will be continuing to talk about our equity journey continuum. I wanted to hit on that again because we did have numerous questions last week, so we'll take a bit of a deep dive into that. And um, Mr. Larry Varn was kind enough to join us this evening as well in case there are more questions that he is better able to answer. So he is here for that as well. And there is an attached report. So this covers just a tiny bit of what is in that report. So uh, there is much, much more in the attached report and even more in the report card itself, but we will take a deep dive into these areas. So this is the SAT data. 
And the SAT is reported in two sections, the ELA section and the math section. So we will look at the ELA section first. On this side, you can see uh, the various levels that College Board uh, puts out for scores um, to meet certain levels. And anything that is a three meets standards or a four exceeds standards would be considered proficient. So in, on the next couple of slides, you'll see the data presented as percent proficient. So that means students who have achieved that level three or four. So this, these are the ranges for ELA. The math ranges are slightly different. So this slide shows the five-year trend data, and you will notice that 2020 is missing. So our five-year trend data goes back to 2017. A couple of things to pull out of this particular set of data. We are, our, our proficiency in 2022 um, is more than double that of the state. So that's a, a definite point of positivity. If we look at the trend, we do see a decline in that rate of proficiency. And that's true across the state. And we have, of course, reason to believe that this is partially pandemic related. So we do need to be really just mindful of this data in over the next few years as, as, as things have returned to normal and we continue on that track to make sure that we are seeing this data rise again and not continue to decline. Another thing that the report card allows us to do is disaggregate the data for various student groups. You are not seeing all of the student groups here because this data is only reported for groups of students that have 10 or more members. So uh, we have several student groups who don't quite meet that threshold, so they are not included. But this does point out a sum of the achievement gaps we have, and we will be looking more at, at achievement gaps later in the presentation. But this does point out some of the areas where we really need to focus on some of our student groups for uh, this is Libertyville data. And so we're here we see the largest gaps in those bottom three student groups that are listed, the low income students, students with disabilities and students with IEPs. So those are student groups that we need to pay attention to and strategize to ensure they're successful as well. Vernon Hills uh, demographic breakdown is similar. We have a couple more student groups that come into play for Vernon Hills. So one of the student groups that we see for Vernon Hills is English learners. And of course the ELA portion of the SAT is a struggle for English learners as it is an English test. So we certainly see a large gap there. We see some of the same gaps we also saw with Libertyville. So again, just areas where we need to make sure we are putting our focus and really paying attention to the students in those groups. So the math data will be presented in a very similar way. The uh, ranges for the scores are there on the screen. So it's slightly different from ELA. Uh, same thing though, a three or a four is uh, considered proficient. And the five-year trend data is very similar. So again, we do see that we are almost doubling the state in our rate of proficiency, but we are seeing a decline since 2017, kind of a steady, we were kind of steady for a few years and then we went down. And again, we can likely attribute that to the pandemic and some learning loss that may have happened. So we need to make sure though that we are on top of this data and ensuring that we start to see this go back up in the future. Something to really, really pay attention to as we move forward. And the disaggregation, again, we see very similar things. We see the same groups of students who have uh, gaps in their achievement. Again, looking at low income students, students with disabilities and students with IEPs. Uh, we also see a bit of a gap here with our Hispanic and Latino students. And again, very similar. The, the data continues to, to be similar as we go. So it really does give us a view of student groups that we need to be strategizing and finding solutions for. 
uh, so that we can uh, so that we can help those students ensure their success. And of course, the more student groups that are being successful, that's going to raise the overall proficiency as well. So it all works together. Okay, and I'm going to turn this part over to Yesenia for the achievement gap. Um, the following slides are going to show the achievement gap at each of the high schools um, for um, we're going to look at Latino students um, and white students, as well as low income students and non low income students and then students with IEPs and students without IEPs. Uh, neither school had a large enough um, student uh, uh, black population at the junior level, so we need at least 10 students who were juniors taking the SAT for um, us to be able to report on the black student population, but we can report on it as a district. So that will be the last slide where we will look at that as a whole. <clears throat> so we're gonna start with LHS. And so here you can see the achievement gap for our Latino students. So in ELA, the gap uh, for 2022 is at 13%, uh, which is an improvement from 2021. And in math, the gap is, um, at, there's a 19% gap between our um, Latino students and our white students, uh, which is also an improvement from 2021. Um, for low-income students, um, the ELA gap is, uh, there's a 28% gap, which is 3% bigger than 2021, but it is also it is an improvement from 2018 and 2019. Um, in math, the gap is uh, 51%, which is double from 2021. Um, and kind of back where we were at when we started, or at least the 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 2018 year where, where we can uh, make the comparison to on, on the report card. Um, and so although there was improvement from 2018 to 19, which I think is great, I think some of that, um, um, the issues with the pandemic uh, have uh, derailed some of that good work that was happening. And so we're, we're kind of back at the starting point, but I'm hopeful that we can turn around like we did earlier. Um, the next one is students with IEPs and students without IEPs. So here the ELA gap is 49% um, for, language arts, which is an improvement from 2021. And in math, the gap is 52%, which is about six, six points um, larger than it was last year. So moving on to Vernon Hills, uh, we're gonna start off with our Latino students. So um, we see a gap in ELA for 2022 at 33%, um, which is 13 points larger than it was last year. And in math, the gap is 38%, um, which is um, 24 percentage points larger than it was in 2021. So if you take a closer look at this table, you will notice that from 2019 to 2021, there was improvement in decreasing the gap in ELA and math. Um, in ELA, we saw a movement from um, minus 32 in 2019 to minus 20 in 2021. And in math, we saw improvement from minus 21 in 2019 to minus 14 in 2021. So we're all aware of how difficult the last school year was, um, but we can say that the supports that were in place uh, at between 2018 and 2019 did support students. So I think it's a matter of going back and, and, and analyzing what those supports were and, and how we can continue them. Um, for low-income students and non-low-income students, um, the current, um, or for the 2022 school year, the gap is at uh, 50%, um, which is 14 points higher than it was last year. And in math, it's at 51% um, um, lower, which is 18 percentage points larger than it was in 2021. And then for students with IEPs and students without IEPs, the ELA achievement gap is at, um, there's a 52% uh, gap between um, our students with IEPs and students without IEPs. And in math, it's a uh, 55%. I think it works better when you're far away. <laughs> 
And so this is uh, for black students and this is um, looking at um, the district as a whole. So we see that in 2022, the ELA gap was 49%, which is 22 percentage points larger than it was last year. And in math, it is 49%, which is 19 percentage points larger than it was in 2021. Um, so overall, we have interventions in place to support um, students. And unfortunately, we don't have a system to track the success of the academic interventions and to provide a determination as to whether or not they are sustained. Um, and if students, or if students stay in, in the interventions for an extended period of time, so that is something that our team is, is looking at starting to um, develop this school year is identifying a system that's going to work for us so that we can um, provide better data on how our interventions are working and what supports we can have in place to support our students in, in the subgroups. And I also think going back and looking at those years where we had increases in certain subgroups, identifying what it was that, that was successful with those years um, and, and what we can do to, to bring some of those pieces back. I was gonna go back to Charlotte. Can I ask before um, you go? Sure. Um, the SAT proficiency score, It's is it just one measure of the gaps that we're looking for? Yes, so that is, it's just the SAT test, I think, one of the things that we're planning on doing is looking at, because uh, we also have access to PSAT data and looking at the performance of all of these subgroups in the PSAT data so we could have more than just the one um, assessment, which is the annual SAT assessment. And we also have to identify, like we, we do have benchmarking assessment um, available to our students, but not all of our students take it. It's not like given systemically in reading and mathematics. And that could also be a predictor as to how students will perform on the SAT. That is something else that, that we are looking at um, developing for further use, right? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good point because what you, you look at this data, excuse me, and what you don't think about is the fact that each one of these columns represents an entirely different set of students correct with a whole uh, entirely different sets of challenges and whatnot and the fact that 2022 was really a very difficult year starting in hybrid and doing you know that was probably the the worst impacted year of any of the 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 covid um uh, situation so you know you have to sort of put those things into perspective that these are very different kids taking the test each year and maybe not even, you know, in 2021, maybe not even everyone that would have normally taken it took it because of the the situation we were in. So it's, it's interesting data, but yeah, I'll, I'll be anxious to see some of that other as well to see PSAT versus the SAT and see how the cohorts actually. Fall. Right. I think the cohort data yeah. is what we'll be looking forward to. Yeah. And with Charlotte on staff, we'll be able to do a, a much more sophisticated yeah. way of saying class of 2024, here's how they scored as freshmen. And here's how the subgroup scored. Mm -hmm. We use that data for interventions. And then here's how we were able to close the gap their sophomore year and their junior year. So I think that's for the national test. I think the other thing we are looking for is some local assessments that are common. So we invest in star math and star reading, but not all students take both of those. And many schools do use those as local indicators where all students take that. And it gives us a more real-time version. And then finally, we could also continue to explore some other common assessments that our departments or teachers might offer that are even more closely aligned with our curriculum. Yeah. And, and what what kind of struck me is the groups that did well, they also did well by a pretty significant margin. The groups that did not do well, didn't do well by a significant margin. And I, I was kind of wondering, they both groups, all these groups went through the same pandemic experience, but why is it that some of them did so differently than the others? And that's kind of what I'm I'm thinking about. I don't know how to answer it. I'm guessing that life circumstances for some of those students just changed because of the pandemic um, and are not able to get the support needed to take SATs many times and tutoring and all of that. So 
that's kind of where my head was going and seeing what we can do to support, you know, those populations. Yes, there are definitely, I think, external factors with, um, especially when it comes to our at-risk students or our students who um, typically have a harder time with these exams, but there are, you know, supports that we could put in place to support them here um, at school. And I think I'm interested in other ways, in addition to the SAT, of measuring if our supports are successful. Because while I understand the SAT is the statewide standard, and it makes it very easy to see across the state and across all of the subgroups how people are performing, I think there are also additional ways for us to assess if our supports are successful and adjust them based on things other than the SAT. Yeah, so that is something that we identified early um, this school year is that we don't have a system to do that. So we do have to develop that. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that Dr. Ellis Bowen is going to help me with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so after last week's highlight of the equity journey continuum, I wanted to continue that conversation and I was able to dig a little bit deeper into the data that we have and uh, put some more information together. So this, I believe we saw at last week's presentation, this is what is on our report card. This is what um, anybody can see if they look up our district report card. And this is for the district. It's not for each school. So this shows the three categories where they are uh, putting us on the continuum. And there is a score associated. We don't see it here, but we will see it on subsequent, subsequent slides. So the continuum shows these three areas. So they are, they are, uh, using three categories on the continuum. And those are student learning, learning conditions, and elevating educators. So one of the questions has been, well, what does that mean? What is in those categories? So this slide shows what is in those categories that is relevant to high school. And there's a lot. There's a lot of metrics here that are being looked at. And it is a pretty complex formula that is being used to come up with all these different numbers and finally place us somewhere along the continuum. So you can see learning conditions takes a lot of information from our climate survey, which would be five essentials. Uh, and student learning is going to look as, at some of that performance data, SAT. And then elevating educators has uh, to do with uh, the demographics of the people employed in District 128 and how that compares to our student population. So there's a lot of different things that are looked at here. And I mentioned this in last week's presentation, but this is not any new data that we have to give to the state. This is all information that is already being collected, that's already being reported to ISBE, that they are just kind of pooling to come up with our equity journey continuum. So one of the, uh, I think, really great things, we, we talked about how this data is from several years ago. The data that was used to put this equity journey continuum together is from 2018-19 because the state says that's the, the last year we really have reliable data for this. And based on everything that happened, uh, that's probably true. But we know here, even in those years, we have been working on our own equity journey. And we have a board policy that addresses it with numerous commitments. And you can see on this slide how those commitments fit into the categories that are being looked at. So I think we can be fairly confident that where we are showing on the continuum is probably not where we really are. We've made strides since this, since since the data that they are using to do this. Their formula is complex, so I have not been able to recreate it with more current data, uh, but we'll talk um, toward the end of the presentation um, a little bit more about uh, what we hope to, what we hope and plan to see in the future. But I wanted to point out 
uh, and I will thank Mr. Varn for this slide. I want to point out how what we are doing fits right into the categories they're looking at. So now we are going to look at how we scored on each of the metrics. So all of those things that were listed on a couple of slides ago are here. And these are the, the raw scores that they gave us for each metric, and then they're averaged out for each category. Now, again, how they got to that score is very complex, and they are looking at lots and lots of data but you can see the scores there for the student learning metrics and they average out to a 2.91, which is a moderate to small gap. Uh, what, I, what they don't really show on that first picture of the continuum is, is what, the num wh what the numbers are. The lowest number is a 1.0 and the highest number is a 4.5. It is a continuum, so it's hard to say, well, we're this number, so this is where we are, but we can kind of place ourselves within the different areas of that continuum. We can, can sort of visualize that using these numbers. So that's our student learning, moderate to small gaps, which is about in the middle of the continuum. The learning conditions is a big one. There's a lot here. And this is interesting because we have everything in this set of data from a 1.0 to a four, we have a 4.5. So there's a lot of, of different things going on here that all average out to putting us at moderate to small gaps. So again, we have likely made strides in some of those areas where we are reporting low. We don't see that yet. We will see it next year when this is reported with newer data. Uh, but that is what, based on our 2018-19 data, that is how we scored on those measures. I find, uh, just on that real quick, I find it interesting that they use parent, student, and teacher response rates, not just the ratings, but the response rates as part of the learning conditions. You know, whether the parents care to take a survey or not, I don't know, is that relevant to the learning conditions? That's just my opinion, but I thought that was interesting. And this is the area where we scored uh, the highest small to minimal gaps. And you can see our various scores in those metrics. So in elevating educators, 4.12 small to minimal gaps. So we have seen now, based on that older data, where we have fallen along the continuum. And again, we're this, we know that things have happened since then. So I think that what we're seeing now is really what we have to use as our baseline. This is the first time that we've experienced seeing this continuum. It's the first time that we're getting a look at this. And I think that the while this is interesting and intriguing and, and brings up many questions and many places where we see we can probably do uh, more to grow, I think what's going to be even more impactful knowledge for us as a district is what we see next year. Next year's data will be from this current school year. So we will have a jump of several years and we will be able to see are the strategies and the measures and the action plans that we have actively been working on and putting into place, have they had the desired effect? So I'm really excited for this to be a continuous journey of looking at this year to year and seeing are the things we're putting <laughs> into place successful? Are they working? And are we moving along on our continuum? I also want to, I, I mentioned this last week, but I want to remind us that this is an informational tool for us. It's not a uh, comparison to others. It's, it's a comparison to ourselves. Are we continuing to improve, continuing to get better? And since we right now only have the one set of data, we're going to have to be patient for next year's report card to see how we have grown and how the things we've put into place have made an impact. 
I also would add that <clears throat> the measures that you've listed under each of those categories will be very um, clear options for our action plans for things that we'll be measuring some of those things. So we won't have to recreate the wheel. Some of the things we'll need to have new measures for, but some of them we won't have to wait for the school report card. We can be measuring those every semester. So if it is attendance or if it is discipline rates or things like that, we know that's what the state is using to give us feedback. So that should be something else that we're using for our internal growth measures as well. Thank you. So um, that is, well, before we close, uh, let let me see if we have more questions on our equity journey continuum. And Mr. Varn is here. I'm very, he was, he told me he really hopes you ask him some very challenging questions because, because otherwise he's been sitting here, you know, just waiting. So somebody quick, come up with a question. So I think the only reason that we wouldn't is because we did discuss the this in committee last week, and we are very grateful for you to spend your evening with us to provide us that any additional information. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, we kind of failed you there. Sorry, Charlotte. That's okay. I do want to publicly thank uh, Mr. Varn because he he really did have a hand in putting some of this, uh, making sense of some of this and putting it into a presentation to answer some of the questions that came up last week. So I really do appreciate his leadership there. So to close, as I mentioned, there is an attached report uh, that is much, much, much more in depth. So I hope you will take some time to look into that. These are some of the other things that are in there a lot deeper into the summative designation, which we highlighted last week, but there's even more information on how that works, as well as some other highlight things that are important to know and look at for our district. And of course, there's even more in the report card itself. So there's so much to dig into. You could, you know, you could just lose yourself for days and days in it. Uh, so um, I do want to just end by saying if as you're reading the report or looking at the report card um, and come up with other things that that you have questions about or want to know more about, uh, please, please do uh, let us know. And I'll ask you to please send those questions um, Dr. Herman's way and she'll pass them on to me so that we can uh, if we're getting the same questions uh, over and over, we can address all of you together with those answers. That'd so happy great. to do that if anything more comes up. Thank you. And I'd also like for members of the public, um, this information that we're looking at is available in our board packet, as well as the link to the Illinois report card. So same thing. If members of the public who have access to this information want to dig into it and they have questions, please, by all means, email those to Dr. Herman, and we will make every effort to make sure that the information, which is vast, um, is clear, and we are taking the appropriate actions. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah. a round of applause. <laughs> Excellent job with the data and the presentation. Thank you. thank you very much. Excellent job. Okay. Um, we are moving on to uh, agenda item number seven. Mm -hmm. A is our superintendent's report. Yes, um, given the hour that it's almost 10 o'clock, um, I'm going to abbreviate the strategic plan update um, because the exciting news is that our first action plans are gonna be presented to us in December. So we do have three goal areas and I think that would be too much to do all three in one evening. So we've split it over two. So we will be doing the exploring multiple paths. Um, that team will make a uh, presentation on how we can, again, encourage students to um, you know, explore many different options on their way to being a prepared adult. Um, and then we will also be receiving the report from um, a health, excuse me, health and well-being. Um, so those two teams will have the goals and then the action plans and the metrics ready to share with you and take your feedback before they're finalized. Um, and then we will be doing the equity uh, presentation January 9th. Um, and again, that is a result of our own work, plus the work of that Dubiel, who's been our consultant leading us in that work. Um, so we're very excited for those and many, many staff members have participated on the different teams and we thank them so much for giving of their time and talent to 
uh, help craft the action plans. And we look forward to delivering them on in December and January. Will Dr. Jubiel be um, joining us in January? She will not. Okay. Thank no you. Mm -hmm. okay. we, we did get to spend four days with her and she coached us on the construction of the, the analysis of the data and the construction of the action plans that we're going to be presenting to you. So we feel very supported by the work that she did with our team. And she also has offered to continue to coach us as we implement the, the action plans that we've set forth. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, any board comments or events that we'd like to share together? I'll just make a couple. One is one an event that's not really, this is intended to be more instructional or board related, but the big event was a great success. I thought that was great. And I don't know if you were going to say anything additional about that, but that's a, that was an event that I attended that I uh, thoroughly enjoyed. I had an, a couple other things, the Ed Red School Safety Committee. There's a committee within Ed Red. Ed Red's our um, school um, advocacy group. Um, so we had our first meeting a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's about 14 of us right now. It includes board members, administrators, uh, all, all kinds of people from from the education uh, environment, so to speak. So uh, more to come on that, but it was more of an introductory and trying to get some <laughs> some baseline uh, there. I also just to add on to that, I am also serving on the special education funding and regulations committee of Ed Red. So I think mm -hmm. we have one person on each of yeah. two of the three goal areas that they've set for this yeah. year. And there's also a board member um, group that meets, which I've joined. Yeah, um, so they're meeting we'll... in December. Unfortunately, I have a yeah. conflict with, yeah. but I I'll have joined there. that group. Yeah. yeah, so there's a few of us involved in that. So um, I also. Um, attended a, a K-12 um, tech forum with a couple of the uh, D-128 tech folks. That was interesting, uh, learning about uh, educational technology and also a uh, the tech and learning summit. So this is sort of crosses over its education, but it's also has to do with my job. So it was, uh, but looking at the future of education and innovative use of uh, education, uh, technology and education. So that's what I did this month. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else have anything they want to share? Is there anything we need to be ready for for this coming? Like, is there a set plan or list or things that we're going to go see? I know that you put a spreadsheet together. I guess I haven't gone um, back so to look at that. Recently. Don is talking about the um, joint annual conference, right. the school board conference this weekend. And um, I put together a spreadsheet so that we can sort of divide and conquer uh, we do have multiple board members that will attend the same workshops, but the idea is to sort of spread out, okay. um, tie mm -hmm. our attendance to the strategic plan or the mission mm -hmm. or our foundational goals um, so that we're spending our time wisely and then come back and share information together. Um, but that spreadsheet is not yet complete. Um, the conference does start on Friday. So if anybody hasn't had a chance to go in and sort of plan which workshops they'd like to attend, I encourage them to go ahead and do that. I have some additions to put in. Yeah, great. As long as it's by Friday, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. This is also a friendly reminder to use the app mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah. trying to go through the ISB website. The app's really good. You can apply all the filters to see, you know, the topics grouped and the days grouped and the times grouped. And, and it remembers your schedule for you. Yeah. <laughs> Sends you reminders. There's so many things going on. It's hard to keep. Yeah. Right. Well, and I felt also that using, um, you know, the, the spreadsheet that we're working on as a group, it was helpful in just identifying the topics that much more easily, right. being able to really focus on those strategic plans or foundational goals. So I found that very useful. Thank you for that. Good. Um, and then I have an addition to make two uh, things I've gotten to attend. Yeah, so please, I was also able to attend uh, the District 128 Foundation's big event, and that was a totally agreed, a resounding success. I had a great time. Um, it was wonderful to connect with uh, people in the district, and you know, the committee just put a fantastic event together and. If you haven't been, you got to go. It was great. Um, 
And then I also had an opportunity uh, a couple of weeks ago to see the Vernon Hills production of Cinderella, which was a real treat. Um, it again speaks to, I say this every time I see a production, but I'm by the district uh, theater theater departments um, that we are, we are just so lucky to have such tremendous access, community access to world-class theater here. Um, and our fine arts faculty, I think, is probably second to none. I'm always just blown away by what I see between just all the musical arrangement, uh, the choreography, the unbelievable talents of our students, and then all of the talent you don't even know is happening there because the crew is just so flawless and seamless in what they're able to accomplish. So um I brought my two younger children with me, 10 and seven, and it was a relatively long show for them. And they were captivated the entire time. And they were catching, my older one was catching all the little jokes that should have, that was flying over the little one's head. So we were having a grand old time. And I really, I can't, I can't speak enough to what that offers our community. And and just as a general member of the community, um, how much I appreciate it. So thank you, fine arts departments. And I, I heard the same thing. Um, I was able to attend uh, with some of my fellow board members and community members, um, the, the Vernon Hills Theater. High School um, senior dinner um, and many of the members. Uh, it was very well attended by the senior community. I'm looking forward to the one at LHS, but the one at VHHS, um, the seniors were saying over and over how much they looked forward to that event because of the quality mm -hmm. of the productions and that they felt like they were, as you said, at a, a world-class performance and they were just so impressed by the quality of our fine, fine arts and the talent of our students. So um, I, we can't ever say enough um, how enriching the fine arts education, uh, both curricular and extracurricular are. are. And just to add, I, I it was well attended, but what I really noticed, which was remarkable, and maybe because it was Cinderella and child friendly, so to speak, it, it wasn't just people associated with our schools directly who were there. There were people from various groups of the community with different ages of audience members, and I was just really impressed by the whole thing. People turn out for these shows, so it was great. Anybody have anything else they'd like to share? I just wanted to share one last thing in relation to the presentation we received on our school report card. Um, you know, as we're celebrating our fine arts productions and things like that, I think it's really important when we were looking at the achievement gap data to know that we were rated exemplary, both schools, and that there are so many amazing things going on in our classrooms. But we also have to hold, it's also true that we have a group of students for whom we know they can achieve higher. We know that that they're they're capable of more. And I just want to keep reminding us that that both things are true. Yeah. That we have amazing educators who are doing amazing work in our schools, and we have some groups of students who need us to be doing something more or differently, and we're committed to doing that. So I'm very very proud of our report card. Um, and I know sometimes it's hard to look at some of those gaps. But we were the people who are going to be able to make things happen. And I'm just very proud to be a part of this group. Well said, Dr. Herman. Thank you. Um, moving on to the IASB report, please. It's really the, uh, you know, what we talked about, the uh, conference coming up this weekend. A lot of information in your your packet that you got tonight, including your badge. Don't forget it. Um, and uh, the the spreadsheet. I, I think that's helpful. If for no other reason that I know what. I get a sense for what other people are doing and attending and I can try to avoid and or supplement that with something different. So sure. That's good. Um, but I would say if there are multiple people that really want to attend the same thing, please feel free. Don't feel like you can't attend something because other board members are, but um, I'm looking, very much looking forward to the opportunity. Um, it's a great boost for our governance, for our education as a board, for our team building as a board. Um, and we really appreciate the chance um, that the community gives us to attend mm -hmm. this as a group. Um, no CEDAW report, any other reports before we move on to future agenda items? Um, I have a suggested future agenda item moving right along. Um, I would like us to take a look again at our board policy regarding public comment. 
uh, we discussed uh, after the pandemic whether or not we were going to leave email public comments in place, and we decided as a group to do that as a service to our community because not everybody was um, comfortable mm -hmm. coming in person. Um, now I think it's a time uh, for us to examine that one more time as a group and decide if we want to continue email public comment. Of course, any member of the public can email us at any time, mm -hmm. but I think the discussion item for a future uh, committee in December, um, I would suggest is whether or not we continue to read those aloud at board meetings or whether we simply receive them as a board mm -hmm. because our board policy doesn't require us mm -hmm to read emailed public comments aloud at board meetings. And I'm uh, grateful that people in other communities want to comment, but I think that opens the door to um, some things that could really derail our board business. And I, I would like to address that uh, before it becomes a problem now that we have moved past um, pandemic in-person restrictions. I think it's probably a good time too, because I believe there was just another press. Um, we we updated some. So, uh, uh, yeah, we uh, updated that one in August. Um, um, but I think there's some some additional ones coming. There up. are out. I I just got yeah. the whole packet yeah. on whether this there's an update for this. So this one is board policy two uh, two three zero. So yeah. in yeah. Uh, section two, and then board policy two thirty. So if you want to look at that one, but this was just updated in August right. um, of 2022. But I will, uh, we have a lot of updates coming um, yeah. from press policy. So maybe so. we just bundle it all at the same yeah. time. So I don't know if there's an update on this one. Yeah, I'm getting to that. So future, some at some point, yeah. um, I'd like to add that to agenda for us to discuss. Good idea. I just have one um, proposal. Since we are going to the conference, we should publish sort of what have we learned as a group from it and well what do you think um in the, at the december meeting um in the for information for information section uh for the board comments and events i think that's a great opportunity yep. for us to share publicly mm -hmm. what we've learned together yep and as always if somebody receives um uh, an artifact that's worth sharing uh we can do that as well and it would be great also beyond that if you could tie something to the action plans that you're coming up with right i mean that's the point of going so at that same conversation i'll probably have a few comments on the delegate assembly <laughs> bring that full circle too yes and we should mention um for anyone who did not have a chance that's interested in um, our discussion of the items that you'll be voting on at the delegate assembly. We had an extensive conversation about that last week in committee, and that is available on our website. So um, Jim, as our delegate, will be voting um, along the consensus that we arrived at on those items that we discussed. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, I have another item. Yes. For future agenda. Yes, um, please. If we could... Um, bring up the idea or discussion of adding Diwali to eventual school calendars mm -hmm. um, designated as a, a school holiday. I think that would be a useful conversation to have. So I think we're going to give the administration time uh, that they need and then ask uh, for, mm -hmm. for, for, your, for your discretion as an administration on when it's time for the board to discuss it. Because I think I think the administration probably needs a chance to do some work before yep. uh, bringing it to the board as an agenda item for us to discuss so that um, the research and the information that needs to be presented. Um, the calendar it, implication, it, it, everything. It, yes, and it, and philosophically, I think it's different than the um, implementation and we wanna be sure that we get both right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it, it's important so that we don't lose sight of it so that we at least have some closure whatever we decide on doing the good news is for this coming for this current school year it falls on a weekend so it's really for looking into the future and how we might address that the when, current school year it's it, it was over in november yeah. right for, i, I meant yeah. For, yeah i meant for the coming school year for the oh, okay. next fall yeah Sorry. Yeah, you're right <laughs> yeah next fall it falls on a sunday i believe so is that something that you are discussing now or you're prepared to discuss 
not prepared to discuss, but I want, just wanted to share. No, I don't mean with us, I mean <laughs> with each other. Like that's something you yeah. have on your agenda. Um, John did a great job in bringing that uh, student voice to our DLT. So we yeah. knew okay. that you would be receiving the information you did tonight. So thank you for that. And that's exactly how we want students to be mm -hmm. able to bring that to our attention. Um, I was able to connect with several other superintendents this afternoon mm -hmm. at a luncheon for North suburban, suburban superintendents. And I asked about the status of how, how they continue to consider the structure of their calendars. Several said that they have been um, taking this particular issue or request um, about which days should we recognize through their equity and inclusion committee and having parents and students. So it's so it's seen not just as a calendar item, but that it's also seen sure. through that lens um, and with varying outcomes. Several schools in our area have come to the consensus that they cannot continue to rec they go have gone to a secular calendar and others say no we're going to develop a policy that talks about the process or the threshold and so it was very interesting i think we have some very good examples from some of our neighboring districts of not just thinking of them as just one holiday at a time That's but right. instead to use this request to consider diwali as how can we improve our overall process and what kind of guidelines does the board want to consider for future groups yeah. who might be asking for And I appreciate that because the, the, the system is very important because we will have future requests mm -hmm. in addition to Diwali. Mm -hmm. And I think we want to be prepared um, how we look at each one. Um, I think it's important. Um, so I feel between Yesenia and Larry, thinking about the calendar and the um, access and the equity that we want to be showing, um, we'll be able to bring back something that's not just for Diwali, but that we could be having some recommendations on a few more, um, either policy language or some other criteria that, that we would want you yeah. to be thinking about. So, yeah. so that we respond to the community as it evolves. I mean, it, you know, the community now looks much different than it did a hundred years ago and it'll look much different 50 years from now. So it'll, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I appreciate that thoughtful approach. Do we have any other future agenda items? Okay. May I ask for a motion to adjourn, please? There. Carmichael moved to adjourn. Batson second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Oh, sorry. Voice vote. My, my apologies. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Thank you. Motion passes. We are adjourned. <laughs> Celebrate.